Chapter sixty seven of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter sixty seven Little King Peepy. Valapi, or the Isle of Yams, being within plain sight of Medea's dominions, we were not very long in drawing nigh to its shores. Two long parallel elevations, rising some three arrow flights into the air, double ridge the island's entire length, lapping between a widening veil so level withal that at either extremity the green of its groves blends with the green of the lagoon, and the isle seems divided by a strait. Within several paces of the beach our canoes keeled the bottom, and camel-like mutely hinted that we voyagers must dismount. Hereupon the assembled islanders ran into the water, and with bent shoulders obsequiously desired the honour of transporting us to land. The beach gained, all present wearing robes instantly stripped them to the waist, a naked chest being their salute to kings. Very convenient for the common people, this, their half-clad forms presenting a perpetual and profound salutation. Presently Pipi, the ruler of Valapi, drew near, a boy hardly ten years old, striding the neck of a burly mute, bearing a long spear erect before him to which was attached a canopy of five broad banana leaves new plucked thus shaded little peepy advanced steadying himself by the forelock of his bearer besides his bright red robe the young prince wore nothing but the symbol of valapian royalty a string of small close-fitting concave shells coiled and ambushed in his profuse curly hair one end falling over his ear revealing a serpent's head curiously carved from a nutmeg quite proverbial, the unembarrassed air of young slips of royalty. But there was something so surprisingly precocious in this young peepee that at first one hardly knew what to conclude. The first compliments over the company were invited inland to a shady retreat. As we pursued the path, walking between old Mohi, the keeper of chronicles, and Samoa, the Upoluan, Babalanja besought the former to enlighten a stranger concerning the history of this curious peepee whereupon the chronicler gave us the following account, for all of which he alone is responsible. Peepy, it seems, had been proclaimed king before he was born, his sire dying some few weeks previous to that event, and vacating his divan, declared that he left a monarch behind. Marvels were told of Peepy, along with the royal dignity, and superadded to the soul possessed in his own proper person, the infant monarch was supposed to have inherited the valiant spirits of some twenty heroes, sages, simpletons, and demigods, previously lodged in his sire. Most opulent in spiritual gifts was this lord of Valapi, the legatee, moreover, of numerous anonymous souls, bequeathed to him by their late loyal proprietors. By a slavish act of his convocation of chiefs, he also possessed the reversion of all in singular the immortal spirits, whose first grantees might die intestate in Valapi servile yet audacious senators, thus prospectively to administrate away the inalienable rights of posterity. But while yet unborn, the people of Valapi had been deprived of more than they now sought to wrest from their descendants, and former P.P.'s, infant and adult, had received homage more profound than P.P. the present. Witness the demeanor of the chieftains of old upon every new investiture of the royal serpent. In a fever of loyalty, they were wont to present themselves before the heir to the isle, to go through with the court ceremony of the pupera, a curious proceeding so called, inverted endeavors to assume an erect posture, the nasal organ, the base. It was to the frequent practice of this ceremony that most intelligent observers imputed the flattened noses of the elderly chiefs of the island, who nevertheless much gloried therein. It was these chiefs also who still observed the old-fashioned custom of retiring from the presence of royalty with their heads between their thighs, so that while advancing in the contrary direction, their faces might be still deferentially turned toward their lord and master. A fine view of him did they obtain. All objects look well through an arch. But to return to P.P., the inheritor of souls and subjects, it was an article of faith with the people of Valapi that P.P. not only actually possessed the souls bequeathed to him, but that his own was enriched by their peculiar qualities. 
the headlong valour of the late Tongatona, the pusillanimous discretion of Blandu, the cunning of Voyot, the simplicity of Raimonda, the prodigality of Zonary, the thrift of Titoni. But had all these and similar opposite qualities simultaneously acted as motives upon P.P., certes, he would have been a most pitiable mortal, in a ceaseless eddy of resolves, incapable of a solitary act. But blessed be the gods, it was otherwise, though it fared little better for his subjects as it was. His assorted souls were uppermost and active in him one by one. Today valiant Tongatona ruled the isle, mediating wars and invasions. Tomorrow, thrice discreet Blandu, who, disbanding the levies, turned his attention to the terraces of yams and so on in rotation to the end. Whence, though capable of action, P.P., by reason of these revolving souls in him, was one of the most unreliable of beings. What the open-handed Zonary promised freely today, parsimonious to Tonti withheld tomorrow, and forever Raimonda was annulling the doings of Voyo, and Voyo the doings of Raimonda. What marvel, then, that in Valapi all was legislative uproar and confusion, advance and retreat, abrogations and revivals, foundations without superstructures, nothing permanent but the island itself. Nor were there those in the neighboring countries who failed to reap profit from this everlasting transition state of the affairs of the kingdom. All boons from Pipi were entreated when the prodigal Zonary was lord of the ascendant, and audacious claims were urged upon the state when the pusillanimous Blandu shrank from the thought of resisting them thus subject to contrary impulses, over which he had not the faintest control, P.P. was plainly denuded of all moral obligation to virtue. He was no more a free agent than the heart which beat in his bosom. Wherefore, his complacent parliament had passed a law, recognizing that curious but alarming fact, solemnly proclaiming that King P.P. was minus a conscience, agreeable to truth. But when they went further and vowed by statute that P.P. could do no wrong, they assuredly did violence to the truth, besides making a sad blunder in their logic. For far from possessing an absolute aversion to evil, by his very nature, it was the hardest thing in the world for Peepy to do right. Taking all these things into consideration, then, no wonder that this wholly irresponsible young prince should be a lad of considerable assurance in the easiest manners imaginable. End of chapter 67《Chapter Sixty Eight of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Sixty Eight: How Teeth Were Regarded in Valapi. Coiling through the thickets like the track of a serpent, wound along the path we pursued, and ere long we came to a spacious grove embowering an oval arbor. Here we reclined at our ease, and refreshments were served. Little worthy of mention occurred save this. Happening to catch a glimpse of the white even teeth of Horora, one of the attendants, King Peepy coolly begged of Medea the favor to have those same dentals drawn on the spot and presented to him. Now human teeth extracted are reckoned among the most valuable ornaments in Mardi. So open wide thy strong box, Horora, and show thy treasures. What a gallant array! standing shoulder to shoulder without a hiatus between. A complete set of jewelry, indeed, thought Peepy. But it seems not destined for him, Medea leaving it to the present proprietor, whether his dentals should change owners or not. And here to prepare the way for certain things hereafter to be narrated, something farther needs to be said concerning the light in which men's molars are regarded in Mardi. Strung together, they are sported for necklaces, or hung in drops from the ear. They are wrought into dice, in lieu of silken locks, are exchanged for love tokens. As in all lands men smite their breasts and tear their hair when transported with grief, so in some countries teeth are stricken out under the sway of similar emotions. To a very great extent this was once practiced in the Hawaiian Islands, ere idol and altar went down. Still living in Oahu are many old chiefs who were present at the famous obsequies of their royal old generalissimo Tamahamaha, when there is no telling how many pounds of ivory were cast upon his grave. Ah, had the regal white elephants of Siam been there, 
doubtless they had offered up their long hooked tusks whereupon they impale the leopards their foes and the unicorn had surrendered that fixed bayonet in his forehead and the imperial cachalot whale the long chain of white towers in his jaw yea over that grim warrior's grave the mooses and elks and stags and fallow deer had stacked their antlers as soldiers their arms on the field terrific shade of tattooed tamahamaha if from a vile dragon's molars rose mailed men what heroes shall spring from the cannibal canines once pertaining to warriors themselves am i the witch of endor that i conjure up this ghost or king saul that i so quake at the sight for lo round about me tamahamaha's tattooing expands till all the sky seems a tiger's skin but now the spotted phantom sweeps by as a man of war's mainsail cloud-like blown far to leeward in a gale banquo down we return envelope prevails not the barbarous hindu custom of offering up widows to the shades of their lords for bereaved the widows there marry again nor yet prevails the savage hawaiian custom of offering up teeth to the manes of the dead for at the decease of a friend the people rob not their own mouths to satisfy their woe on the contrary they extract the teeth from the departed distributing them among the mourners for memorial legacies as elsewhere silver spoons are bestowed from the high value ascribed to dentals throughout the archipelago of mardi and also from their convenient size they are circulated as money strings of teeth being regarded by these people very much as belts of wampum among the winnebagos of the north or cowries among the bengalese so that in valpo the very beggars are born with a snug investment in their mouths too soon however to be appropriated by their lords leaving them toothless for the rest of their days and forcing them to diet on poi pudding and banana blanc -mange. as a currency teeth are far less clumsy than coconuts which among certain remote barbarians circulate for coin one nut being equivalent perhaps to a penny the voyager who records the fact chuckles over it hugely as evincing the simplicity of those heathens not knowing that he himself was the simpleton since that currency of theirs was purposely devised by the men to check the extravagance of their women coconuts for spending money being such a burden to carry it only remains to be added that the most solemn oath of a native of valapi is that sworn by his tooth by this tooth said bondo to nujumo by this tooth i swear to be avenged upon thee o nujumo end of chapter sixty eight chapter sixty nine of mardi and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 69. The Company Discourse and Braidbeard Rehearses a Legend. Finding in Valapi no trace of her whom we sought, and but little pleased with the cringing demeanor of the people, and the wayward follies of Peepi their lord, we early withdrew from the isle. As we glided away, King Medea issued a sociable decree. He declared it his royal pleasure that throughout the voyage all stiffness and state etiquette should be suspended nothing must occur to mar the freedom of the party to further this charming plan he doffed his symbols of royalty put off his crown laid aside his sceptre and assured us that he would not wear them again except when we landed and not invariably then are we not all now friends and companions he said so companions and friends let us be i unbend my bow do ye likewise but are we not to be dignified asked Bapalanja if dignity be free and natural be as dignified as you please but away with rigidities away they go said babalanja and my lord now that you mind me of it i have often thought that it is all folly and vanity for any man to attempt a dignified carriage why my lord frankly crossing his legs where he lay the king who receives his ambassadors with a majestic toss of the head may have just recovered from the toothache that thought should cant over the spine he bears so bravely have a care sir there is a king within hearing pardon my lord i was merely availing myself of the immunity bestowed upon the company hereafter permit a subject to rebel against your sociable decrees i will not be so frank any more well put babalanja come nearer here 
cross your legs by mine you have risen a cubit in my regard vivi bring us that gourd of wine so pass it round with the cups now yumi a song and a song was sung and thus did we sail pleasantly reclining on the mats stretched out beneath the canopied howdah at length we drew nigh to a rock called pella or the theft a high green crag toppling over its base and flinging a cavernous shadow upon the lagoon beneath bubbling with the moisture that dropped passing under this cliff was like finding yourself as some sea hunters unexpectedly have beneath the open upper jaw of a whale which descending infallibly entombs you but familiar with the rock our paddlers only threw back their heads to catch the cool pleasant tricklings from the mosses above wiping away several glittering beads from his beard old mohi turned round where he sat just outside the canopy solemnly affirmed that the drinking of that water had cured many a man of ambition how so old man demanded medea because of its passing through the ashes of ten kings of yore buried in a sepulchre hewn in the heart of the rock mighty kings and famous doubtless said babalanja whose bones were thought worthy of so noble and enduring an urn pray mohi their names and terrible deeds alas their sepulchre only remains and no doubt like many others they made that sepulchre for themselves they sleep sound my word for it old man but i very much question if were the rock rent any ashes would be found mohi i deny that those kings ever had any bones to bury why babalanja said medea since you intimate that they never had ghosts to give up you ignore them in toto denying the very fact of their being even defunct ten thousand pardons my lord no such discourtesy would i do to the anonymous memory of the illustrious did but whether they ever lived or not it is all the same with them now yet grant that they lived then if death be a deaf and dumb death a triumphal procession over their graves would concern them not if a birth into brightness then mardi must seem to them the most trivial of reminiscences or perhaps theirs may be an utter lapse of memory concerning sublunary things and they themselves be not themselves as the butterfly is not the larva said yumi then babalanja your account that a fit illustration of the miraculous change to be wrought in man after death no for the analogy has an unsatisfactory end from its chrysalis state the silkworm but becomes a moth that very quickly expires its long existence is as a worm all vanity vanity yumi to seek in nature for positive warranty to these aspirations of ours through all her provisions nature seems to promise immortality to life but destruction to beings or as old bardiana has it if not against us nature is not for us said medea rising babalanja you have indeed put aside the courtier talking of worms and caterpillars to me a king and a demigod to renown for your theme a more agreeable topic pardon once again my lord and since you will let us discourse of that subject first i lay it down for an indubitable maxim that in itself all posthumous renown which is the only renown is valueless be not offended my lord to the nobly ambitious renown hereafter may be something to anticipate but analyzed that feverish typhoid feeling of theirs may be nothing more than a flickering fancy that now while living they are recognized as those who will be as famous in their shrouds as in their girdles said yumi but those great and good deeds babalanja of which the philosophers so often discourse must it not be sweet to believe that their memory will long survive us and we ourselves in them i speak now said babalanja of the ravening for fame which even appeased like thirst slaked in the desert yields no felicity but only relief and which discriminates not in aught that will satisfy its cravings but let me resume not an hour ago braidbeard was telling us that story of prince Altimo who in odorous while living expressed much delight at the prospect of being perfumed and embalmed when dead but was not otimo the most eccentric of mortals for few men issue orders for their shrouds to inspect their quality beforehand far more anxious are they about the texture of the sheets in which their living limbs lie and my lord with some rare exceptions does not all mardi by its actions declare that it is far better to be notorious now than famous hereafter 
a base sentiment my lord said yumi did not poor bonja the unappreciated poet console himself for the neglect of his contemporaries by inspiriting thoughts of the future in plain words by bethinking him of the glorious harvest of bravos his ghost would reap for him said babalanja but banjo bonjo binjo i never heard of him nor i said mohi nor i said medea poor fellow cried babalanja i fear me his harvest is not yet ripe alas cried yumi he died more than a century ago but now that you speak of unappreciated poets yumi said babalanja shall i give you a piece of my mind do said mohi stroking his beard he who on all hands passes for cipher to-day if it all remembered hereafter will be sure to pass for the same for there is more likelihood of being overrated while living than of being underrated when dead and to ensure your fame you must die a rather discouraging thought for your race but answer i assume that king medea is but a mortal like you now how may i best perpetuate my name long pondered babalanja then said carve it my lord deep into a ponderous stone and sink it face downward into the sea for the unseen foundations of the deep are more enduring than the palpable tops of the mountains sailing past pella we gained a view of its farther side and seated in a lofty cleft beheld a lonely fisherman solitary as a seal on an iceberg his motionless line in the water what recks he of the ten kings said babalanja mohi said medea methinks there is another tradition concerning that rock let us have it in old times of jenny and giants there dwelt in barren lands not very remote from our outer reef but since submerged a band of evil-minded envious goblins furlongs in stature and with immeasurable arms who from time to time cast covetous glances upon our blooming isles long they lusted till at last they waded through the sea strode over the reef and seizing the nearest islet rolled it over and over toward an adjoining outlet but the task was hard and daybreak surprised them in the midst of their audacious thieving while in the very act of giving the devoted land another doughty surge and somerset leaving it bottom upward and midway poised gardens under water its foundations in the air they precipitately fled in their great haste deserting a comrade vainly struggling to liberate his foot caught beneath the overturned land this poor fellow now raised such an outcry as to awaken the god upi or the archer stretched out on a long cloud in the east who forthwith resolved to make an example of the unwilling lingerer snatching his bow he let fly an arrow but overshooting its mark it pierced through and through the lofty promontory of a neighboring island making an arch in it which remaineth even unto this day a second arrow however accomplished its errand the slain giant sinking prone to the bottom and now added mohi glance over the gunwale and you will see his remains petrified into white ribs of coral ay there they are said yumi looking down into the water where they gleamed a fanciful legend great beard very entertaining said medea even so said babalanji but perhaps we lost time in listening to it for though we know it we are none the wiser be not a cynic said medea no pastime is lost time musing a moment babalanja replied my lord that maxim may be good as it stands but had you made six words of it instead of six syllables you had uttered a better and a deeper end of chapter sixty nine Chapter Seventy of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Seventy: The Minstrel Leads Off with a Paddle Song, and a Message is Received from Abroad. From seaward now came a breeze so blithesome and fresh that it made us impatient of Babalanja's philosophy and Mohi's incredible legends. One and all, we called upon the minstrel Yumi to give us something in unison with the spirited waves wide foaming around us if my lord will permit we will give taji the paddle chant of the warriors of king bello by all means said medea so the three canoes were brought side to side their sails rolled up and paddles in hand our paddlers seated themselves sideways on the gunwales yumi as leader 
occupying the place of the foremast or bow paddler of the royal barge whereupon the six rows of paddle blades being uplifted and every eye on the minstrel this song was sung with actions corresponding the canoes at last shooting through the water with a violent roll all thrice waved on high our paddles fly thrice round the head thrice dropped to feet and then well timed of one stout mind all fall and back the waters heap bow paddler who lifts this chant who sounds this vaunt all the wild sea song to the billows throng rising falling hoarsely calling now high now low as fast we go fast on our flying foe bow paddler who lifts this chant who sounds this vaunt all dip dip in the brine our paddles dip 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 the fins of our swimming ship how far the waters part as on we dart our sharp prows fly and curl on high as the upright fin of the rushing shark rushing fast and far on his flying mark like him we pray like him we slay swim on the fog our prow up below bow paddler who lifts this chant who sounds this vaunt all heap back heap back the water's back pile them high astern in billows black till we leave our wake in the slope we make and rush and ride on the torrent's tide here we were overtaken by a swift gliding canoe which bearing down upon us before the wind lowered its sail when close by its occupants signing our paddlers to desist i started the strangers were three hooded damsels, the enigmatic Queen Houtia's heralds. Their pursuit surprised and perplexed me, nor was there wanting a vague feeling of alarm to heighten these emotions. But perhaps I was mistaken, and this time they meant not me. Seated in a prow, the foremost waved her iris flag, cried Yumi, some message, Taji, that iris points to you. It was then I first divined that some meaning must have lurked in those flowers they had twice brought me before. The second damsel now flung over me Circe flowers, then a faded jonquil buried in a tuft of wormwood leaves. The third sat in the shallop's stern, and as it glided from us, thrice waved oleanders. What dumb show is this? cried Medea. But it looks like poetry, minstrel, you should know. Interpret them, said I. Shall I then be your Flora's flute, and Houtia's dragoman? Held aloft the iris signified a message. These purple-woven Circe flowers mean that some spell is weaving. That golden pining jonquil, which you hold buried in those wormwood leaves, says plainly to you, bitter love in absence. Said Medea, well done, Taji, you have killed a queen. Yet no queen Houtia have these eyes beheld. Said Babalanja, the thrice-waved oleanders, Yumi, what mean they? Beware, beware, beware. Then that at least seems kindly meant, said Babalanja. Taji, beware of Houtia. End of chapter 70。Chapter 72 of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 72. A Book from the Chronicles of Mohi. Many, many ages ago there reigned in Juam a king called Ti. This Ti's succession to the sovereignty was long disputed by his brother Marjora, who at last, rallying round him an army, after many vicissitudes, defeated the unfortunate monarch in a stout fight of clubs on the beach. In those days Willamilla, during a certain period of the year, was a place set apart for royal games and diversions, and was furnished with suitable accommodations for king and court. From its peculiar position, moreover, it was regarded as the last stronghold of the Juan Marniki, in remote times, having twice withstood the most desperate assaults from without. And when Rununu, a famous upstart, sought to subdue all the isles in this part of the archipelago, it was to Willamilla that the banded kings had repaired to take counsel together and while there conferring were surprised at the sudden onslaught of Rununu in person. But in the end the rebel was captured, he and all his army, and impaled on the tops of the hills. Now defeated and fleeing for his life, T.I. with his surviving followers was driven across the plain toward the mountains. But to cut him off from all escape to inland Willamilla, Marjora dispatched a fleet band of warriors to occupy the entrance of the defile, Nevertheless, T.I., 
the pursued ran faster than his pursuers first gained the spot and with his chiefs fled swiftly down the gorge closely hunted by marjora's men but arriving at the farther end they in vain sought to defend it and after much desperate fighting the main body of the folk horning up with great slaughterer the fugitives were driven into the glen they ran to the opposite wall of the cliff where turning they fought at bay blood for blood and life for life till at last overwhelmed by numbers they were all put to the point of the spear with fratricidal hate singled out by the ferocious marjora t i fell by that brother's hand when stripping from the body the regal girdle the victor wound it round his own loins thus proclaiming himself king over juam long torn by this internecine war the island acquiesced in the new sovereignty but at length a sacred oracle declared that since the conqueror had slain his brother in deep willamilla so that t i never more issued from that refuge of death therefore the same fate should be marjora's for never thenceforth from that glen should he go forth neither marjora nor any son of his girdled loins nor his son's sons nor the uttermost scion of his race but except this denunciation not was denounced against the usurper who mindful of the tenure by which he reigned ruled over the island for many moons at his death bequeathing the girdle to his son in those days the wildest superstitions concerning the interference of the gods in things temporal prevailed to a much greater extent than at present hence marjora himself called sometimes in the traditions of the island the heart of black coral even unscrupulous marjora had quailed before the oracle he bowed his head say the legends nor was it then questioned by his most devoted adherents that had he dared to act counter to that edict he had dropped dead the very instant he went under the shadow of the defile this persuasion also guided the conduct of the son of marjora and that of his grandson but there at last came to pass a change in the popular fancies concerning this ancient anathema the penalty denounced against the posterity of the usurper should they issue from the glen came to be regarded as only applicable to the invested monarch not to his relatives or heirs a most favourable construction of the ban for all those related to the king freely passed in and out of willamilla from the time of the usurpation there had always been observed a certain ceremony upon investing the heir to the sovereignty with the girdle of ti upon these occasions the chief priests of the island were present acting an important part for the space of as many days as there had reigned kings of majora's dynasty the inner mouth of the defile remained sealed the new monarch placing the last stone in the gap this symbolized his relinquishment for ever of all purpose of passing out of the glen and without this observance was no king girdled in juam it was likewise an invariable custom for the heir to receive the regal investiture immediately upon the decease of his sire no delay was permitted and instantly upon being girdled he proceeded to take part in the ceremony of closing the cave his predecessor yet remaining uninterred on the purple mat where he died in the history of the island three instances were recorded wherein upon the vacation of the sovereignty the immediate heir had voluntarily renounced all claim to the succession rather than surrender the privilege of roving to which he had been entitled as a prince of the blood said ronnie one of these young princes in reply to the remonstrances of his friends what shall i be a king only to be a slave t i s girdle would clasp my waist less tightly than my soul would be banded by the mountains of willamilla a subject i am free no slave in juan but its king for all the tassels round his loins to guard against a similar resolution in the mind of his only son the wise sire of donjalolo ardently desirous of perpetuating his dignities in a child so well beloved had from his earliest infancy restrained the boy from passing out of the glen to contract in the free air of the archipelago tastes and predilections fatal to the inheritance of the girdle but as he grew in years so impatient became young donjalolo of the king his father's watchfulness over him though hitherto a most dutiful son that at last he was prevailed upon by his youthful companions to appoint a day on which to go abroad and visit mardi hearing this determination the old king sought to vanquish it but in vain and early on the morning of the day that donjalolo was to set out he swallowed poison and died in order to force his son into the instant assumption of the honours thus suddenly inherited the event but not its dreadful circumstances was communicated to the prince 
as with a gay party of young chiefs, he was about to enter the mouth of the defile. My sire dead, cried Don Gilolo, so sudden it seems a bolt from heaven, and bursting into exclamations of grief, he wept upon the bosom of Talara, his friend. But starting from his side, my fate converges to a point. If I but cross that shadow, my kingdom is lost. One lifting of my foot and the girdle goes to my proud uncle Darfi, who would so joy to be my master. Haughty dwarf, O oh, Oro, would that I had ere this passing thee, fatal cavern, and seen for myself what outer Mardi is. Say ye true, comrades, that Willamilla is less lovely than the valleys without, that there is bright light in the eyes of the maidens of Mina, and wisdom in the hearts of the old priests of Marama, that it is pleasant to tread on the green earth where you will, and breathe the free ocean air. Would, oh, would that I were but the least of yonder sun clouds, that look down alike on Willamilla and all places besides, then I might determine aright. Yet, why do I pause? Did not Rani, and Atama, and Mardona, my ancestors, each see for himself free Mardi? And did they not fly the proffered girdle, choosing rather to be free to come and go, than bury themselves forever in this fatal glen? O oh, Mardi, Mardi, art thou then so fair to see? Is liberty a thing so glorious? Yet can I be no king, and behold thee, too late, too late, to view thy charms and then return. My sire, my sire, thou hast wrung my heart with this agony of doubt. Tell me, comrades, for ye have seen it, is Mardi sweeter to behold than it is royal to reign over Juam? Silent are ye? Knowing what ye do, were ye me, would ye be kings? Tell me, Talara, no king, no king, that were to obey and not command, and none hath Don Gilolo e'er obeyed but the king his father, a king, and my voice may be heard in farthest Mardi, though I abide in narrow Willamilla. My sire, my sire, ye flying clouds, what look ye down upon? Tell me, what ye see abroad? Methinks sweet spices breathe from out the cave. Hail Don Gilolo, king of Juam, now sounded with acclamations from the groves. Starting, the young prince beheld a multitude approaching, warriors with spears, and maidens with flowers, and Kubla, a priest, lifting on high the tasseled girdle of T.I., and waving it toward him. The young chiefs fell back. Kubla, advancing, came close to the prince, and unclasping the badge of royalty, exclaimed, Don Gilolo, this instant it is king or subject with thee. Wilt thou be girdled monarch? Gazing one moment up the dark defile, then staring vacantly, Don Gilolo turned and met the eager gaze of Darfi. Stripping off his mantle, the next instant he was a king. Loud shouted the multitude and exulted, but after mutely assisting at the closing of the cavern, the new girdled monarch retired sadly to his dwelling, and was not seen again for many days. End of chapter 72「Seventy three of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter seventy three. Something more of the Prince. Previous to recording our stay in his dominions, it only remains to be related of Don Gilolo that after assuming the girdle, a change came over him. During the lifetime of his father, he had been famed for his temperance and discretion. But when Mardi was forever shut out, and he remembered the law of his isle, interdicting abdication to its kings, he gradually fell into desperate courses, to drown the emotions at times distracting him. His generous spirit, thirsting after some energetic career, found itself narrowed down within the little glen of Willamilla, where ardent impulses seemed idle. But these are hard to die, and repulsed all round recoil upon themselves. So with Don Gilolo, who, in many a riotous scene, wasted the powers which might have compassed the noblest designs. Not many years had elapsed since the death of the king, his father, but the still youthful prince was no longer the bright-eyed and elastic boy, who with the dawn of day had sallied out to behold the landscapes of the neighboring isles. Not more effeminate Sardanapalus than he, and at intervals he was the victim of unaccountable vagaries, haunted by spectres, and beckoned to by the ghosts of his sires. At times, loathing his vicious pursuits, which brought him no solid satisfaction, but ever filled him with final disgust, 
he would resolve to amend his ways, solacing himself for his bitter captivity by the society of the wise and discreet. But brief the interval of repentance, anew he burst into excesses, a hundredfold more insane than ever. Thus vacillating between virtue and vice, to neither constant and upbraided by both, his mind, like his person in the glen, was continually passing and repassing between opposite extremes. End of chapter 73「Chapter seventy four of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter seventy four. Advancing deeper into the vale, they encountered Don Gilolo. From the mouth of the cavern, a broad, shaded way overarched by fraternal trees embracing in mid air, conducted us to a cross path on either hand leading to the opposite cliffs shading the twin villages before mentioned. Level as a meadow was the bosom of the glen, here nodding with green orchards of the breadfruit and the palm, there flashing with golden plantations of the banana. Emerging from these, we came out upon a grassy mead, skirting a projection of the mountain, and soon we crossed a bridge of boughs, spanning a trench, thickly planted with roots of the tara, like alligators or hollanders, reveling in the soft alluvial. Strolling on, the wild beauty of the mountains excited our attention. The topmost crags poured over with vines, which, undulating in the air, seemed leafy cascades, their sources the upland groves. Midway up the precipice, along a shelf of rock, sprouted the multitudinous roots of an apparently trunkless tree. Shooting from under the shallow soil, they spread all over the rocks below, covering them with an intricate network while far aloft great boughs, even a copse, clambered to the very summit of the mountain. Then bending over struck anew into the soil, forming, along the verge, an intermediate colonnade, all manner of antic architecture standing against the sky. According to Mohi, this tree was truly wonderful, its seed having been dropped from the moon, where were plenty more similar forests, causing the dark spots on its surface. Here and there the cool fluid in the veins of the mountains gushed forth in living springs. Their waters received in green mossy tanks, half buried in grasses. In one place a considerable stream, bounding far out from a wooded height, ere reaching the ground was dispersed in a wide misty shower, falling so far from the base of the cliff that walking close underneath you felt little moisture. Passing this fall of vapors we spied many islanders taking a bath. But what is yonder swaying of the foliage? And what now issues forth, like a habitation astir? Don Gilolo, drawing nigh to his guests. He came in a fair sedan, a bower, resting upon three long, parallel poles, borne by thirty men, gaily attired, five at each pole end, decked with dyed tapas, and looped with garlands of newly plucked flowers, from which, at every step, the fragrant petals were blown. With a sumptuous elastic motion, the gay sedan came on, leaving behind it a long rosy wake of fluttering leaves and odors. Drawing near, it revealed a slender, enervate youth, of pallid beauty, reclining upon a crimson mat, near the festooned arch of the bower. His anointed hand was resting against the bosom of a girl. Another stirred the air with a fan of pintado plumes. The pupils of his eyes were as floating isles in the sea. In a long, soft tone, he murmured, Medea. The bearers paused, and Medea advancing the island kings bowed their foreheads together. Through tubes ignited at the end, Don Gilolo's reclining attendants now blew an aromatic incense around him. These were composed of the stimulating leaves of Aina, mixed with the long yellow blades of a sweet scented upland grass, forming a hollow stem. In general, the agreeable fumes of the Aina were created by one's own inhalations, but Don Gilolo, deeming the solace too dearly purchased by any exertion of the royal lungs, regaled himself through those of his attendants, whose lips were as moss rosebuds after a shower. In silence, the young prince now eyed us attentively, meanwhile gently waving his hand to obtain a better view through the wreaths of vapor. He was about to address us when, chancing to catch a glimpse of Samoa, he suddenly started, averted his glance, and wildly commanded the warrior out of sight. Upon this his attendants would have soothed him, and Medea desired the Upoluan to withdraw. 
while we were yet lost in wonder at this scene don Jalolo, with eyes closed fell back into the arms of his damsels recovering he fetched a deep sigh and gazed vacantly around it seems that he had fancied samoa the noonday spectre of his ancestor marjora the usurper having been deprived of an arm in the battle which gained him the girdle poor prince this was one of those crazy conceits so puzzling to his subjects medea now hastened to assure don Jalolo that samoa though no cherub to behold was good flesh and blood nevertheless and soon the king unconcernedly gazed his monomania having departed as a dream but still suffering from the effects of an overnight feast he presently murmured forth a desire to be left to his women adding that his people would not fail to provide for entertainment of his guests the curtains of the sedan were now drawn and soon it disappeared in the groves journeying on ere long we arrived at the western side of the glen where one of the many little arbors scattered among the trees was assigned for our abode here we reclined to an agreeable repast after which we strolled forth to view the valley at large more especially the far-famed palaces of the prince End of chapter seventy four chapter seventy one of mardi and voyage thither volume one by herman melville this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 71. They land upon the island of Juam. Crossing the lagoon, our course now lay along the reef to Juam, a name bestowed upon one of the largest islands hereabout, and also collectively upon several wooded isles engulfing it, which together were known as the dominions of one monarch. That monarch was Don Jalolo just turned of twenty-five he was accounted not only the handsomest man in his dominions but throughout the lagoon his comeliness however was so feminine that he was sometimes called fonu or the girl our first view of juam was imposing a dark green pile of cliffs towering some one hundred toises at top presenting a range of steep gable-pointed projections as if some titanic hammer and chisel had shaped the mass sailing nearer we perceived an extraordinary rolling of the sea which bursting into the lagoon through an adjoining breach in the reef surged towards juam in enormous billows at last dashing against the wall of the cliff they played there in unceasing fountains but under the brow of a beetling crag the spray came and went unequally there the blue billows seemed swallowed up and lost right regally was juam guarded for at this point the rock was pierced by a cave into which the great waves chased each other like lions after a hollow subterraneous roaring issued forth with manes dishevelled cautiously evading the dangerous currents here ruffling the lagoon we rounded the wall of the cliff and shot upon a smooth expanse on one side hemmed in by the long verdant northern shore of juam and across the water sentinelled by its tributary islets with sonorous vivi in the shark's mouth we swept toward the beach tumultuous with a throng our canoes were secured and surrounded by eager glances we passed the lower ends of several populous valleys and crossing a wide open meadow gradually ascending came to a range of light green bluffs here we wended our way down a narrow defile almost cleaving this quarter of the island to its base black crags frowned overhead among them the shouts of the islanders reverberated yet steeper grew the defile and more overhanging the crags till at last the keystone of the arch seemed dropped into its place we found ourselves in a subterranean tunnel dimly lighted by a span of white day at the end emerging what a scene was revealed all round embracing a circuit of some three leagues stood heights inaccessible here and there forming buttresses sheltering deep recesses between the bosom of the place was vivid with verdure shining a slant into this wide hollow the afternoon sun lighted up its eastern side with tints of gold but opposite brooded a sombre shadow double shading the secret places between the salient spurs of the mountains thus cut in twain by masses of day and night it seemed as if some last judgment had been enacted in the glen no sooner did we emerge from the defile than we became sensible of a dull jarring sound and yumi was almost tempted to turn and flee when informed that the sea cavern whose mouth we had passed was believed to penetrate deep into the opposite hills 
and that the surface of the amphitheatre was depressed beneath that of the lagoon. But all over the lower hillsides, and sloping into the glen, stood grand old groves, still and stately, as if no insolent waves were throbbing in the mountain's heart. Such was Willamilla, the hereditary abode of the young monarch of Juam. Was Yilla immured in this strange retreat? But from those around us naught could we learn. Our attention was now directed to the habitations of the glen, comprising in two handsome villages, one to the west, the other to the east, both stretching along the base of the cliffs. Said Medea, had we arrived at Willamilla in the morning, we had found Don Jalolo and his court in the eastern village, but being afternoon we must travel farther and seek him in his western retreat, for that is now in the shade. Wending our way, Medea added, that aside from his elevated station as a monarch, Don Jalolo was famed for many uncommon traits, but more especially for certain peculiar deprivations under which he labored. Whereupon Braidbeard unrolled his old chronicles, and regaled us with a history, which will be found in the following chapter. End of chapter 71 Chapter 75 of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1 By Herman Melville This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Chapter 75 Time and Temples In the Oriental Pilgrimage of the Pious Old Purchase and in the fine old folio voyages of Hakelet, Tevenot, Ramusio, and Brie, we read of many glorious old Asiatic temples, very long in erecting, and voracious Gaudentia de Luca hath a wondrous narration of the time consumed in rearing that mighty three hundred and seventy-five pillared temple of the year, somewhere beyond Libya, whereof the columns did signify days, and all round fronted upon concentric zones of palaces, cross-cut, by twelve grand avenues, symbolizing the signs of the zodiac, all radiating from the sun-dome in their midst. And in that wild eastern tale of his, Marco Polo tells us how the great mogul began him a pleasure palace on so imperial a scale that his grandson had much ado to complete it. But no matter for marveling all this, great towers take time to construct. And so of all else. And that which long endures full-fledged must have long lain in the germ, and duration is not of the future but of the past, and eternity is eternal, because it has been, and though a strong new monument be built today, it only is lasting because its blocks are old as the sun. It is not the pyramids that are ancient, but the eternal granite whereof they are made, which had been equally ancient, though yet in the quarry. For to make an eternity we must build with eternities, whence the vanity of the cry for anything alike durable and new, and the folly of the reproach. Your granite hath come from the old-fashioned hills. For we are not gods and creators, and the controversialists have debated whether indeed the all-plastic original and the very suns must to their source for their fire, and we Prometheuses must to them for ours, which, when had, only perpetual vestal tending will keep alive. But let us back from fire to store. No fine firm fabric ever yet grew like a gourd. Nero's house of gold was not raised in a day, nor the Mexican House of the Sun, nor the Alhambra, nor the Escurial, nor Titus's Amphitheater, nor the Illinois Mounds, nor Diana's Great Columns at Ephesus, nor Pompey's Proud Pillar, nor the Parthenon, nor the Altar of Belus, nor Stonehenge, nor Solomon's Temple, nor Tadmor's Towers, nor Susa's Bastions, nor Persepolis's Pediments. Round and round, the Moorish turret at Seville was not wound heavenward in the revolution of a day and from its first founding five hundred years did circle ere Strasbourg's great spire lifted its five hundred feet into the air. No, nor were the great grottos of Elephanta hewn out in an hour, nor did the troglodytes dig Kentucky's mammoth cave in a sun, nor that of Trophonius, nor Antiparos, nor the giant's causeway, nor were the subterranean arched sewers of Etruria channeled in a thrice, nor the airy arched aqueducts of Nerva thrown over their values in the ides of a month nor was Virginia's natural bridge worn under in a year, nor in geology, were the eternal Grampians upheaved in an age. And who shall count the cycles that revolved ere Earth's interior sedimentary strata were crystallized into stone? Nor Peak of Pico, nor Tenerife, were chiseled into obelisks in a decade, nor had Mount Athos been turned into Alexander's statue so soon. And the bower of Artaxerxes, 
took a whole Persian summer to grow, and the Tsar's ice palace a long Muscovite winter to congeal. No, no, nor the pyramid of Cheops masoned in a month, though once built, the sands left by the deluge might not have submerged such a pile. Nor were the broad boughs of Charles's oak grown in a spring, though they outlived the royal dynasties of Tudor and Stuart. Nor were the parts of the great Iliad put together in haste, though old Homer's temple shall lift up its dome, when St. Peter's is a legend. Even man himself lives months ere his maker deems him fit to be born, and ere his proud shaft gains its full stature. Twenty-one long Julian years must elapse and his whole mortal life brings not his immortal soul to maturity, nor will all eternity perfect him. Yea, with uttermost reverence as to human understanding, increase of dominion seems increase of power, and day by day new planets are being added to Elderborn Saturn, even as six thousand years ago our own earth made one more in this system. So in incident, not in essence, may the infinite himself not be less than more infinite now than when old Aldebaran rolled forth from his hand. And if time was, when this round earth, which to innumerable mortals has seemed an empire never to be wholly explored, which in its seas concealed all the Indies over four thousand five hundred years, if time was, when this great quarry of Assyrius and Rome's was not extant, then time may have been when the whole material universe lived its dark ages, yea, when the ineffable silence proceeded from its unimaginable remoteness, espied it as an isle in the sea. And herein is no derogation. For the immeasurable's altitude is not heightened by the arches of Mohammed's heavens, and were all space a vacuum, yet would it be a fullness, for to himself his own universe is he. Thus deeper and deeper into time's endless tunnel does the winged soul, like a night hawk, wend her wild way, and finds eternities before and behind, and her last limit is her everlasting beginning. But sent over the broad-flooded sphere, even Noah's dove came back and perched on his hand. So comes back my spirit to me, and folds up her wings. Thus then, though time be the mightiest of Alarics, yet is he the mightiest mason of all, and a tutor, and a counsellor, and a physician, and a scribe, and a poet, and a sage, and a king. Yea, and a gardener, as ere long will be shown, but first must we return to the glen. End of chapter 75「Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 76. A Pleasant Place for a Lounge. Whether the hard condition of their kingly state very naturally demanding some luxurious requital, prevailed upon the monarchs of Juam to house themselves so delightfully as they did. Whether buried alive in their glen, they sought to center therein a secret world of enjoyment. However it may have been, throughout the archipelago this saying was a proverb. You are lodged like the king in Willamilla. Hereby was expressed the utmost sumptuousness of a palace. A well-warranted saying, for of all the bright places where my soul loves to linger, the haunts of Don Gilolo are most delicious. In the eastern quarter of the glen was the house of the morning. This fanciful palace was raised upon a natural mound, many rods square, almost completely filling up a deep recess between deep green and projecting cliffs, overlooking many abodes distributed in the shadows of the groves beyond. Now, if indeed it be, that from the time employed in its construction, any just notion may be formed of the stateliness of an edifice. It must needs be determined that this retreat of Don Gilolo could not be otherwise than imposing. Full five hundred moons was the palace in completing, for by some architectural arborist its quadrangular foundations had been laid in seed coconuts, requiring that period to sprout up into pillars. In front, these were horizontally connected, by elaborately carved beams of a scarlet hue, inserted into the vital wood, which a swelling out and overlapping firmly secured them. The beams supported the rafters, inclining from the rear, while over the aromatic grasses covering the roof waved the tufted tops of the palms, green capitals to their dusky shafts. Through and through this vibrating verdure, bright birds flitted and sang. The scented and variegated thatch seemed a hanging garden, and between it and the palm-tops was leaf-hung an arbor in the air. Without these columns stood a second and third colonnade, 
forming the most beautiful bowers, advancing through which you fancy that the palace beyond must be chambered in a fountain or frozen in a crystal. Three sparkling rivulets, flowing from the heights, were led across its summit through great trunks half buried in the thatch, and emptying into a sculptured channel, running along the eaves, poured over in one wide sheet, plaited and transparent. Received into a basin beneath, they were thence conducted down the vale. The sides of the palace were hedged by diomi bushes, bearing a flower from its perfume called lenora, or sweet breath, and with these odorous hedges were heavy piles of mats, richly dyed and embroidered. Here lounging of a glowing noon, the plaited cascade playing, the verdure waving, and the birds melodious, it was hard to say whether you were an inmate of a garden in the glen, or a grotto in the sea. But enough for the nonce of the house of the morning. Cross we the hollow to the house of the afternoon. End of chapter 76「Chapter seventy seven of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter seventy seven The House of the Afternoon. For the most part, the House of the Afternoon was but a wing built against a mansion wrought by the hand of nature herself, a grotto running into the side of the mountain. From high over the mouth of this grotto, sloped a long arbor supported by great blocks of stone rudely chiseled into the likeness of idols each bearing a carved lizard on its chest a sergeant's guard of the gods condescendingly doing duty as posts from the grotto thus vestibuled issued hilariously forth the most considerable stream of the glen which seemingly overjoyed to find daylight in willamilla sprang into the arbor with a cheery white bound but its youthful enthusiasm was soon repressed, its waters being caught in a large stone basin, scooped out of the natural rock, whence, staid and decorous, they traversed sundry moats, at last meandering away to join floods with the streams trained to do service at the other end of the vale. Truant streams, the live-long day wending their loitering path to the subterraneous outlet, flowing into which they disappeared, but no wonder they loitered, passing such ravishing landscapes. Thus with life, man bounds out of night, runs and babbles in the sun, then returns to his darkness again, though peradventure once more to emerge. But the grotto was not a mere outlet to the stream. Flowing through a dark flume in the rock on both sides, it left a dry elevated shelf, to which you ascend from the arbor by three artificially wrought steps, sideways disposed, to avoid the spray of the rejoicing cataract. Mounting these and pursuing the edge of the flume, the grotto gradually expands and heightens, your way lighted by rays in the inner distance. At last you come to a lofty subterraneous dome, lit from above by a cleft in the mountain, while full before you in the opposite wall, from a low black arch midway up, and inaccessible, the stream, with a hollow ring and a dash, falls in a long snowy column into a bottomless pool, whence, after many an eddy and whirl, it entered the flume, and away with a rush. Half hidden from view, by an overhanging brow of the rock, the white fall looked like the sheeted ghost of the grotto. Yet gallantly bedecked was the cave, as any old armorial hall, hung round with banners and arras. Streaming from the cleft, vines swung in the air, or crawled along the rocks, whenever a tendril could be fixed. High up, their leaves were green, but lower down, they were shriveled, and dyed of many colors and tattered and torn with much rustling, as old banners again, sore raveled with much triumphing. In the middle of this hall in the hill was incarcerated the stone image of one demi, the tutelar deity of Wilhelmina. All green and oozy, like a stone under water, poor demi, looked as if sore harassed with sciatics and lumbagos. But he was cheered from aloft by the promise of receiving a garland all blooming on his crown. The dryad sporting in the woodlands above forever peeping down the cleft, and essaying to drop him a coronal. Now, the still, panting glen of Willamilla, nested so close by the mountains, and a goodly green mark for the archer in the sun, would have been almost untenable were it not for the grotto. Hereby it breathed the blessed breezes of Omi, a mountain promontory buttressed the island to the east, receiving the cool stream of the upland trades, much pleasanter than the currents beneath. 
At all times, even in the brooding noonday sun, a gush of cool air came hand in hand with the cool waters that burst with a shout into the palace of Don Jalolo. And as, after first refreshing the king, as in loyalty bound, the stream flowed at large through the glen and bathed its verdure, so the blessed breezes of Omi not only made pleasant the house of the afternoon, but finding ample outlet in its wide open front, blew forth upon the bosom of all Willamilla. Come, let us take the air of Omi, was a very common saying in the glen, and the speaker went high with his comrade toward the grotto, and flinging himself on the turf, pass his hand through his locks and recline, making a joy and a business of breathing, for truly the breezes of Omi were as air wine to the lungs. Yet was not this breeze over cool, though at times the zephyrs grew boisterous, especially at the season of high sea, when the strong trades draw down the cleft in the mountain, rushed forth from the grotto with wonderful force. Crossing it, then, you had much ado to keep your robe on your back. Thus much for the house of the afternoon, whither, after spending the shady morning under the eastern cliffs of the glen, daily, at a certain hour, Don Gilolo in his palanquin was born, there finding new shades, and there tarrying till evening, when again he was transported whence he came, thereby anticipating the revolution of the sun. Thus dodging day's luminary through life, the prince hied to and fro in his dominions, on his smooth, spotless brow, Saul's rays never shining. End of chapter 77「seventy eight of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter seventy eight Babalanja Solus. Of the House of the Afternoon, something yet remains to be said. It was chiefly distinguished by its pavement, where, according to the strange customs of the isle, were inlaid the reputed skeletons of Don Gilolo's sires each surrounded by a mosaic of corals, red, white, and black, intermixed with vitreous stones fallen from the skies in a meteoric shower. These delineated the tattooing of the departed. Nearby were embedded their arms, mace, bow, and spear, in similar marquetry, and over each skull was the likeness of a scepter. First and conspicuous lay the half-decayed remains of Marjora, the father of these coral kings. By his side, the storied, sickle-shaped weapon, wherewith he slew his brother T.I. Line of king and row of scepters, said Babalanja as he gazed. Don Jalolo, come forth, and ponder on thy sires. Here they lie, from dread Majora down to him who fathered thee. Here are their bones, their spears, and their javelins, their scepters, and the very fashion of their tattooing, all that can be got together of what they were. Tell me, O king, what are thy thoughts? Dotest thou on these thy sires? Art thou more truly royal that they were kings, or more a man that they were men? Is it a fable or a verity about Marjora and the murdered T.I.? But here is the mighty conqueror. Ask him. Speak to him. Son to sire, king to king. Prick him. Beg, buffet, entreat, spurn. Split the globe. He will not budge. Walk over and over thy whole ancestral line, and they will not start. They are not here. Aye, the dead are not to be found, even in their graves. Nor have they simply departed, for they willed not to go. They died not by choice, whithersoever they have gone. Thither they have been dragged. And if so be, they are extinct. Their nihilities were not more against their grain than their forced quitting of Mardi. Either way, Something has become of them that they sought not. Truly had stout-hearted Marjora sworn to live here in Willamilla for aye, and kept the vow. That would have been royalty indeed. But here he lies. Marjora, rise, Juam revolteth. Lo, I stamp upon thy scepter, base menials tread upon thee, where thou hast. Up, king, up. What? No reply. Are not these bones thine? Oh, how the living triumph over the dead. Marjora, Answer, art thou, or art thou not? I see thee not, I hear thee not, I feel thee not. Eyes, ears, hands are worthless to test thy being. And if thou art, thou art something beyond all human thought to compass. We must have other faculties to know thee by. Why, thou art not even a sightless sound, 
not the echo of an echo. Here are thy bones. Don Gilolo, methinks I see these fallen upon by assassins. Which of thy fathers riseth to the rescue? I see thee dying. Which of them telleth thee what cheer beyond the grave? But they have gone to the land unknown. Meet phrase. Where is it? Not one of Oro's priests telleth a straight story concerning it. Twill be hard finding their paradises. Touching the life of Alma in Mohi's Chronicles, tis related that a man was once raised from the tomb, but rubbed he not his eyes, and stared he not most vacantly? Not one revelation did he make, ye gods, to have been a bystander there. At best, tis but a hope, but will a longing bring the thing desired? Doth dread avert its object? An instinct is no preservative. The fire I shrink from may consume me, but dead, and yet alive alive, yet dead, thus say the sages of Marama. But die we not, our unborn sons? But die we then living? Yet if our dead fathers somewhere and somehow live, why not our unborn sons? For backward or forward, eternity is the same. Already have we been the nothing we dread to be. Icy thought. But bring it home. It will not stay. What ho, hot heart of mine, to beat thus lustily a while, to feel in the red rushing blood and then be ashes. Can this be so? But peace, peace, thou liar in me, telling me I am immortal. Shall I not be as these bones, to come to this? But the balsam dropping palms, whose bowls run milk, whose plumes wave boastfully in the air, they perish in their prime, and bow their blasted trunks. Nothing abideth. The river of yesterday floweth not to-day. The sun's rising is a setting, living is dying. The very mountains melt, and all revolve, systems and asteroids. The sun wheels through the zodiac, and the zodiac is a revolution. Ah, gods, in all this universe stir, am I to prove one stable thing? Grim chiefs and skeletons of aunt, ye are but dust, be like the dust of beggars. For on this road paupers may lie down with kings, and filch their skulls. This, great Majora's arm? No, some old paralytics, ye kings? Ye, men, where are your vouchers? I do reject your brotherhood, ye libelous remains. But no, no, despise them not, O Babalanja. Thy own skeleton, thou thyself dost carry with thee, through this mortal life, and I would view it, but for kind nature's screen. Thou art death alive, and e'en to what's before thee wilt thou come. I, thy children's children, will walk over thee, thou voiceless as a calm, and over the coral kings Babalanja paced in profound meditation. End of chapter 78。Chapter 79 of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 79 The Center of Many Circumferences. Like Don Gilolo himself, we hie to and fro, for back now must we pace to the house of the morning. In its rear there diverged three separate arbors, leading to less public apartments. Traversing the central arbor and fancying it will soon lead you to open ground, you suddenly come upon the most private retreat of the prince, a square structure, plain as a pyramid, and without as inscrutable. Down to the very ground its walls are thatched, but on the further side a passageway opens, which you enter. But not yet are you within. Scarce a yard distant stands an inner thatched wall, blank as the first. Passing along the intervening corridor, lighted by narrow apertures, you reach the opposite side, and a second opening is revealed. This entering another corridor, lighted as the first but more dim, and a third blank wall, and thus three times three you worm round and round, the twilight lessening, as you proceed until at last you enter the citadel itself, the innermost arbor of a nest, whereof each has its roof, distinct from the rest. The heart of the place is but small, illuminated by a range of open skylights, downward contracting. Innumerable as the leaves of an endless folio, multitudinous mats cover the floor, whereupon reclining by night, like Pharaoh on the top of his patrimonial pile, the inmate looks heavenward, and heavenward only gazing at the torchlight processions in the skies, when, in state, the suns march to be crowned. And here, in this impenetrable retreat, 
centrally slumbered the universe rounded zodiac belted horizon zoned sea girt reef sashed mountain locked arbor nested royalty girdled arm clasped self hugged indivisible don Jalolo, absolute monarch of juam the husk in husked meat in a nut the innermost spark in a ruby the juice nested seed in a golden rinded orange the red royal stone in an effeminate peach the ensphered sphere of spheres End of chapter 79Chapter 80 of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 80. Don Jalolo in the Bosom of His Family. To pretend to relate the manner in which Juam's ruler passed his captive days, without making suitable mention of his harem, would be to paint one's full-length likeness and omit the face. For it was his harem that did much to stamp the character of Don Jalolo and had he possessed but a single spouse more discourteous surely to have overlooked the princess much more than as it is and by how much the more a plurality exceeds a unit exclusive of the female attendants by day waiting upon the person of the king he had wives thirty in number corresponding in name to the knights of the moon for in juam time is not reckoned by days but by nights each night of the lunar month having its own designation which relatively only is extended to the day in uniform succession the thirty wives ruled queen of the king's heart an arrangement most wise and judicious precluding much of that jealousy and confusion prevalent in ill-regulated seraglios for as thirty spouses must be either more desirable or less desirable than one so is a harem thirty times more difficult to manage than an establishment with one solitary mistress but don Jalolo's wives were so nicely drilled that for the most part things went on very smoothly nor were his brows much furrowed with wrinkles referable to domestic cares and tribulations although as in due time will be seen from these he was not altogether exempt now according to braidbeard who among other abstruse political researches had accurately informed himself concerning the internal administration of don Jalolo's harem the following was the method pursued therein on the aquila or first night of the month the queen of that name assumes her diadem and reigns so too with azolino the second and voluvi the third night of the moon and so on even unto the utter eclipse thereof through calends nones and ides for convenience the king is furnished with a card whereon are copied the various ciphers upon the arms of his queens and parallel thereto the hieroglyphics significant of the corresponding nights of the moon. Glancing over this, Don Jalolo predicts the true time of the rising and setting of all his stars. This moon of wives was lodged in two spacious seraglios, which few mortals beheld. For so deeply were they buried in a grove, so overpowered with verdure, so overrun with vines, and so hazy with the incense of flowers, that they were almost invisible unless closely approached certain it was that it demanded no small enterprise diligence and sagacity to explore the mysterious wood in search of them though a strange sweet humming sound as of the clustering and swarming of warm bees among roses at last hinted the royal honey at hand high in air toward the summit of the cliff overlooking this side of the glen a narrow ledge of rocks might have been seen from which rumour whispered was to be caught an angular peep at the tip of the apex of the roof of the nearest seraglio but this wild report had never been established nor indeed was it susceptible of a test for was not that rock inaccessible as the airy of young eagles but to guard against the possibility of any visual profanation don Jalolo had authorized an edict for ever tabooing that rock to foot of man or pinion of fowl birds and bipeds both trembled and obeyed taking a wide circuit to avoid the spot access to the seraglios was had by corresponding arbors leading from the palace the seraglio to the right was denominated ravi before and that to the left zono after the meaning of which was that upon the termination of her reign the queen wended her way to the zono there tarrying with her predecessors till the ravi was emptied when the entire moon of wives swallow-like migrated back whence they came and the procession was gone over again in due order the queens reposed upon mats inwoven with their respective ciphers in the ravi the mat of the queen apparent 
or next in succession, was spread by the portal. In the zono the newly widowed queen reposed farthest from it. But alas, for all the method where thirty wives are concerned. Notwithstanding these excellent arrangements, the mature result of ages of progressive improvement in the economy of the royal seraglios in Willamilla, it must needs be related that at times the order of precedence became confused and was very hard to restore. At intervals some one of the wives was weeded out, to no small delight of the remainder. But to their equal vexation her place would soon after be supplied by some beautiful stranger, who, assuming the denomination of the vacated knight of the moon, thenceforth commenced her monthly revolutions in the king's infallible calendar. In constant attendance was a band of old men, woe-begone, thin of leg, and puny of frame, whose grateful task it was to tarry in the garden of Donjalolo's delights, without ever touching the roses. Along with innumerable other duties, they were perpetually kept coming and going upon ten thousand errands, for they had it in strict charge to obey the slightest behests of the damsels, and with all imaginable expedition to run, fly, swim, or dissolve into impalpable air at the shortest possible notice. So laborious their avocations, that none could discharge them for more than a twelve month, at the end of that period giving up the ghost, out of pure exhaustion of the locomotive apparatus. It was this constant drain upon the stock of masculine old age in the glen that so bethinned its small population of grey beards and hoary heads. And any old man hitherto exempted, who happened to receive a summons to repair to the palace, and there wait the pleasure of the king, this unfortunate, at once suspecting his doom, put his arbor in order, oiled and suppled his joints, took a long farewell of his friends, selected his burial place, and going, resigned to his fate, in due time, expired like the rest. Had any one of them cast about for some alleviating circumstance, he might possibly have derived some little consolation from the thought, that though a slave to the whims of thirty princesses, he was nevertheless one of their guardians, and as such he might ingeniously have concluded their superior. But small consolation this, for the damsels were as blithe as larks, more playful than kittens, never looking sad and sentimental, projecting clandestine escapes. But supplied with the thirtieth part of all that Aspasia could desire, glorying in being the spouses of a king, nor in the remotest degree anxious about eventual dowers, they were carefree, content, and rejoicing as the rays of the morning. Poor old men, then, it would be hard to distill out of your fate one drop of the balm of consolation for commission to watch over those who forever kept you on the trot, affording you no time to hunt up peccadilloes, was not this circumstance an aggravation of hard times, a sharpening and edge-giving to the steel in your souls? But much yet remains unsaid. Dwell no more upon the eternal wear and tear incident to these attenuated old warders. They were intensely hated by the damsels. Inasmuch as it was archly opined, for what ulterior purposes they were retained. Nightly couching, on guard, round the seraglio, like fangless old bronze dragons, round a fountain enchanted, the old men ever and anon cried out mightily, by reason of sore pinches and scratches received in the dark, and try tribly try triply girt about as he was. Don Gilolo himself started from his slumbers, raced round and round through his ten thousand corridors, at last bursting all dizzy among his twenty-nine queens to see what under the seven heavens was the matter, when lo and behold, there lay the innocents all sound asleep, the dragons moaning over their mysterious bruises. Ah, me, his harem, like all large families, was the delight and the torment of the days and nights of Don Gilolo. and in one special matter he was either eminently miserable or otherwise, for all his multiplicity of wives he had never an heir not his the proud paternal glance of the grand turk soliman looking round upon a hundred sons all bone of his bone and squinting with his squint end of chapter eighty chapter eighty one of mahdi and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan Chapter 81. Wherein Babalanja relates the adventures of one Karkiki in the Land of Shades. At our morning repast, on the second day of our stay in the hollow, our party indulged in much lively discourse. Samoa, 
said I, those isles of yours, of whose beauty you so often make vauntful mention, can those isles good Samoa furnish a valley in all respects equal to Willamilla? Disdainful answer was made that Willamilla might be endurable enough for a sojourn, but as a permanent abode any glen of his own natal island was unspeakably superior. In the great valley of Savai, cried Samoa, for every leaf grown here in Willamilla grows a stately tree, and for every tree here waving in Savai flourishes a goodly warrior. Immeasurable was the disgust of the Upoluan for the enervated subjects of Don Gelolo, and for Don Gelolo himself, though it was shrewdly divine that his annoying reception at the hands of the royalty of Juam had something to do with his disdain. To Jarl no similar question was put, for he was sadly deficient in a taste for the picturesque but he cursorily observed that in his blue-water opinion Willamilla was next to uninhabitable, all view of the sea being intercepted. And here it may be well to relate a comical blunder on the part of honest Jarl, concerning which Samoa the savage often afterward twitted him, as indicating a rusticity and want of polish in his breeding. It rather originated, however, in his not heeding the conventionalities of the strange people among whom he was thrown. The anecdote is not an epic, but here it is. Reclining in our arbor, we breakfasted upon a marble slab, so frost-white and flowingly traced with blue veins, that it seemed a little lake sheeted over with ice. Diana's virgin bosom congealed. Before each guest was a richly carved bowl and gourd, fruit and wine freighted, also the empty hemisphere of a small nut, the purpose of which was a problem. Now King Jarl scorned to admit the slightest degree of underbreeding in the matter of polite feeding, so nothing was a problem to him. At once reminded of the morsel of avarut in his mouth, a substitute for another sort of sedative than unattainable, he was instantly illuminated concerning the purpose of the nut, and very complacently introduced each to the other, in the innocence of his ignorance, making no doubt that he had acquitted himself with discretion the little hemisphere plainly being intended as a place of temporary deposit for the arva of the guests. The company were astounded, Samoa more than all, King Jarl meanwhile looking at all present with the utmost serenity. At length one of the horrified attendants, using two sticks for a forceps, disappeared with the obnoxious nut upon which the meal proceeded. This attendant was not seen for many days, which gave rise to the supposition that journeying to the seaside he had embarked for some distant strand, there to bury out of sight the abomination with which he was freighted. Upon this, his egregious misadventure, calculated to do discredit to our party and bring Medea himself into contempt, Babalanja had no scruples in taking Jarl roundly to task. He assured him that it argued but little brains to evince a desire to be thought familiar with all things, that however desirable as incidental attainments, conventionalities in themselves were the very least of arbitrary trifles, the knowledge of them innate with no man. Moreover, Jarl, he added, in essence, conventionalities are but mimickings at which monkeys succeed best. Hence, when you find yourself at a loss in these matters, wait patiently, and mark what the other monkeys do, and then follow suit, and by so doing you will gain a vast reputation as an accomplished ape. Above all things follow not the silly example of the young spark Karkiki, of whom Mohi was telling me, dying and entering the other world with a mincing gait, and there finding certain customs quite strange and new, such as friendly shades passed through each other by the way of a salutation. Karkiki, nevertheless, resolved to show no sign of embarrassment. Accosted by a phantom with wings folded pensively, plumes interlocked across its chest, he off head, and stood obsequiously before it. Staring at him for an instant, the spirit cut him dead, murmuring to itself, Ah, some terrestrial bumpkin, I fancy, and passed on with its celestial nose in the highly rarefied air. But silly Karkiki, undertaking to replace his head, found that it would no more stay on, but forever tumbled off, even in the act of nodding a salute, which calamity kept putting him out of countenance. And thus through all eternity is he punished for his folly in having pretended to be wise, wherein he was ignorant. Head under arm he wanders about, the scorn and ridicule of the other world. Our repast concluded, messengers arrived from the prince, courteously inviting our presence at the house of the morning. 
thither we went journeying in sedans sent across the hollow for that purpose by don Jalolo. end of chapter eighty one chapter eighty two of maudi and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter eighty two how don Jalolo sent agents to the surrounding isles with the result ere recounting what was beheld on entering the house of the morning some previous information is needful though so many of don Jalolo's days were consumed by sloth and luxury there came to him certain intervals of thoughtfulness when all his curiosity concerning the things of outer mardi revived with augmented intensity in these moods he would send abroad deputations inviting to willamilla the kings of the neighboring islands together with the most celebrated priests barbs story-tellers magicians and wise men that he might hear them converse of those things which he could not behold for himself but at last he bethought him that the various narrations he had heard could not have been otherwise than unavoidably faulty by reason that they had been principally obtained from the inhabitants of the countries described who very naturally must have been inclined to partiality or uncandidness in their statements wherefore he had very lately dispatched to the isle special agents of his own honest of heart keen of eye and shrewd of understanding to seek out every thing that promised to illuminate him concerning the places they visited and also to collect various specimens of interesting objects so that at last he might avail himself of the researches of others and see with their eyes but though two observers were sent to every one of the neighboring lands yet each was to act independently make his own inquiries form his own conclusions and return with his own specimens wholly regardless of the proceedings of the other it so came to pass that on the very day of our arrival in the glen these pilgrims returned from their travels and don Jalolo had set apart the following morning to give them a grand public reception it was to this that our party had been invited as related in the chapter preceding in the great palm hall of the house of the morning we were assigned distinguished mats to the right of the prince his chiefs attendants and subjects assembled in the open colonnades without when all was in readiness in marched the company of savants and travellers and humbly standing in a semicircle before the king their numerous hampers were deposited at their feet don Jalolo was now in high spirits thinking of the rich store of reliable information about to be furnished zuma said he addressing the foremost of the company you and varnopi were directed to explore the island of rafona proceed now and relate all you know of that place your narration heard we will list to varnopi with a profound inclination the traveller obeyed but soon don Jalolo interrupted him what say you zuma about the secret cavern and the treasures therein a very different account this from all i have heard hitherto but perhaps yours is the true version go on but very soon poor zuma was again interrupted by exclamations of surprise nay even to the very end of his mountings but when he was done don Jalolo observed that if from any cause zuma was in error or obscure varnopi would not fail to set him right so varnopi was called upon but not long had varnopi proceeded when don Jalolo changed colour what he exclaimed will ye contradict each other before our very face o oh, oro how hard is truth to become by it proxy fifty accounts have i had of rafona none of which wholly agree and here these two varlets sent expressly to behold and report these two lying knaves speak crookedly both how is it are the lenses in their eyes diverse hued that objects seem different to both for undeniable is it that the things they thus clashingly speak of are to be known for the same though represented with unlike colours and qualities but dumb things cannot lie nor err unpack thy hamper zuma here bring them close now what is this that tremblingly replied zuma is a specimen of the famous reef bar on the west side of the island of rafona your highness perceives its deep red dyes said don Jalolo, varnopi hast thou a piece of this coral also i have your highness said varnopi here it is taking it from his hand don Jalolo gazed at its bleached white hue then dashing it to the pavement o oh, mighty oro truth dwells in her fountains where every one must drink for himself for me vain all hope of ever knowing mardi away 
Better know nothing than be deceived. Break up. And Don Gelolo rose and retired. All present now broke out in a storm of vociferation, some siding with Zuma, others with Varnopi, each of whom in turn was declared the man to be relied upon. Marking all this, Babalanja, who had been silently looking on, leaned against one of the palm pillars, quietly observing to Medea, My lord, I have seen this same reef at Rafona. In various places it is of various hues. As for Zuma and Varnopi, both are wrong, and both are right. End of chapter 82Chapter eighty three of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter eighty three. They visit the tributary islets. In Willamilla, no Yilla being found, on the third day we took leave of Don Gelolo, who lavished upon us many caresses, and somewhat reluctantly on Medea's part, we quitted the vale. One by one, we now visited the outer villages of Juam and crossing the waters, wandered several days among its tributary isles. There we saw the viceroys of him who reigned in the hollow, chieftains of whom Dongelolo was proud, so honest, humble, and faithful, so bent upon ameliorating the condition of those under their rule. For be it said, Dongelolo was a charitable prince, in his serious intervals, ever seeking the welfare of his subjects, though after an imperial view of his own. But alas, in that sunny donjon among the mountains where he dwelt, how could Don Gelolo be sure that the things he decreed were executed in regions forever remote from his view? Ah, very bland, very innocent, very pious, the faces his viceroys presented during their monthly visits to Willamilla. But as cruel their visage when, returned to their islets, they abandoned themselves to all the license of tyrants, like Verus reveling down the rights of the Sicilians. Like Carmelites, they came to Don Gelolo barefooted, but in their homes, their proud latchets were tied by their slaves. Before their king-belted prince, they stood rope girdles, rope girdled, like self-abased monks of St. Francis. But with those ropes, before their palaces, they hung innocence and truth. As still seeking Yilla, and still disappointed, we roved through the lands which these chieftains ruled, Babalanja exclaimed, Let us depart, idle our search in isles that have viceroys for kings. At early dawn, on embarking for a distant land, there came to us certain messengers of Don Gelolo, saying that their lord the king, repenting of so soon parting company with Medea and Taji, besought them to return with all haste, for that very morning in Willamilla a regal banquet was preparing, to which many neighboring kings had been invited, most of whom had already arrived. Declaring that there was no alternative but compliance, Medea acceded, and with the king's messengers we returned to the glen. End of chapter 83 Chapter 84 of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1 by Herman Melville This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan Chapter 84 Taji sits down to dinner with twenty-five kings, and a royal time they had. It was afternoon when we emerged from the defile, and, informed that our host was receiving his guests in the house of the afternoon, thither we directed our steps. Soft in our face blew the blessed breezes of Omi, stirring the leaves overhead, while here and there, through the trees, showed the idol bearers of the royal retreat, hand in hand, linked with festoons of flowers. Still beyond, on a level, sparkled the nodding crowns of the kings, like the constellation Corona Borealis, the horizon just gained. Close by his noontide friend, the cascade at the mouth of the grotto, reposed on his crimson mat, Don Gelolo, arrayed in a vestment of the finest white tapa of Mardi, figured all over with bright yellow lizards, so curiously stained in the gauze that he seemed overrun, as with golden mice. Marjora's girdle girdled his loins, tasseled with the congregated teeth of his sires, the jewelled turban tiara, milk white, surmounted his brow over which waved a copse of pintado plumes. But what sways in his hand? A scepter, similar to those likenesses of scepters, embedded among the corals at his feet. A polished thigh bone, by Braidbeard declared once T.I.'s the murdered. 
for to emphasize his intention utterly to rule, Marjor himself had selected this emblem of dominion over mankind. But even this last despite done to dead T.I. had once been transcended. In the usurper's time prevailed the belief that the saliva of kings must never touch ground, and Mohi's chronicles made mention that during the lifetime of Majora, T.I.'s skull had been devoted to the basest of purposes, Majora's, the hate no turf could bury. Yet traditions like these ever seem dubious. There be many who deny the hump, moral and physical, of Gloucester Richard. Still advancing, unperceived, in social hilarity we descried their highnesses, chatting together like the most plebeian of mortals, full as merry as the monks of old. But marking our approach, all changed. A pair of potentates, who had been playfully trifling, hurriedly adjusted their diadems, threw themselves into attitudes, looking stately as statues. Phidias turned not out his Jupiter so soon. In various dyed robes the five and twenty kings were arrayed, and various their features, as the rows of lips, eyes, and ears, in John Caspar Lavater's physiognomical charts. Nevertheless, to a king, all their noses were aquiline. There were long foxtail beards of silver grey, and enameled chins, like those of girls, bald pates, and Merovingian locks, smooth brows and wrinkles, forms erect and stooping, an eye that squinted, one king was deaf, by his side, another that was halt, and not far off, a dotard. They were old and young, tall and short, handsome and ugly, fat and lean, cunning and simple. With animated courtesy, our host received us, assigning a neighboring bower for Babalanja and the rest. And among so many right royal, demi-divine guests, how could the demigods Medea and Taji be otherwise than at home? The unwanted sprightliness of Don Jalolo surprised us, but he was in one of those relapses of desperate gaiety invariably following his failures in efforts to amend his life and the bootless issue of his late mission to outer mardi had thrown him into a mood for revelry nor had he lately shunned a wild wine called mirando a slave now appearing with a bowl of this beverage it circulated freely not to gainsay the truth we fancied the mirando much a nutty pungent flavor it had like some kinds of arrack distilled in the Philippine Isles, and a marvellous effect did it have in dissolving the crystallization of the brain, leaving nothing but precious little drops of good humour beating round the bowl of the cranium. Meanwhile, garlanded boys, climbing the limbs of the idle pillars, and stirruping their feet in the most holy mouths, suspended hangings of crimson tapa all round the hall, so that sweeping the pavement there rustled in the breeze from the grot. Presently, stalwart slaves advanced, bearing a mighty basin of a porphyry hue, deep hollowed out of a tree. Outside were innumerable grotesque conceits, conspicuous among which, for a border, was an endless string of the royal lizards circumnavigating the basin in inverted chase of their tails. Peculiar to the groves of Willamilla, the yellow lizard formed part of the arms of Juam, and when Don Jalolo's messenger went abroad, they carried its effigy as the emblem of their royal master, themselves being known as the gentlemen of the golden lizard. The poor free-hued basin planted full in our midst, the attendants forthwith filled the same with the living waters from the cascade, a proceeding for which some of the company were at a loss to account, unless His Highness our host, with all the coolness of royalty, purposed cooling himself still further by taking a bath in presence of his guests. A conjecture most premature, for directly the basin being filled to within a few inches of the lizards, the attendants fell to launching therein diverse good-sized trenchers, all laden with choice viands, wild boar meat, humps of grampuses, and browned breadfruit, roasted in odoriferous fires of sandalwood, but suffered to cool, goldfish, dressed with the fragrant juices of berries, citron sauce, rolls of the baked paste of yams, juicy bananas, steeped in a saccharine oil, marmalade of plantains, jellies of guava, confections of the treacle of palm sap, and many other dainties, besides numerous stained calabashes of morando and other beverages, fixed in carved floats to make them buoyant. The guests assigned seats by the woven handles attached to his purple mat, the prince our host, was now gently moving by his servitors to the head of the porphyry-hued basin, where, flanked by lofty crowned heads, white tiarred and radiant with royalty, he sat, 
like snow-turbaned Mont Blanc at sunrise, presiding over the headwaters of the Rhone to right and left, looming the gilded summits of the Simplon, the Gotthard, the Jungfrau, and the great St. Bernard, and the Grand Glockner. Yet turbid from the launching of its freight, Lake Como tossed to and fro its navies of good cheer, the shadows of the King Peaks wildly flitting thereupon. But no frigid wine and fruit cooler Lake Como, as at first it did seem, but a tropical dining table, its surface a slab of light blue St. Pons marble in a state of fluidity. Now many a crown was doffed, scepters laid aside, girdles slackened, and among those verdant viands the bearded kings, like goats, did browse, or tusking their wild boar's meat, like mastiffs, ate. And like unto some well-fought fight, beginning calmly, but pressing forward to a fiery rush, this well-fought feast did now wax warm. A few royal epicures, however, there were, epicures intent upon concoctions, admixtures, and masterly compoundings, who comported themselves with all due deliberation and dignity, hurrying themselves into no reckless deglutition of the dainties. Ah, admirable conceit, Lake Como superseding attendants, for from hand to hand the trenchers sailed, no sooner gaining one port than dispatching over sea to another. Well suited they were for the occasion, sailing high out of water, to resist the convivial swell, at times ruffling the sociable sea, and sharp at both ends, still better adapting them to easy navigation. But soon the Mirando in triumphant decanters went round, reeling like box before a breeze. But their voyages were brief, and ere long in certain havens the accumulation of empty vessels threatened to bridge the lake with pontoons. In those directions trade winds were setting. But full soon, cut out were all unladen and unprofitable gourds, and replaced by jolly-bellied calabashes, for a time sailing deep, yawing heavily to the push. At last, the whole flotilla of trenchers, wrecks and all, were sent swimming to the further end of Lake Como, and thence removed, gave place to ruddy hillocks of fruit, and floating islands of flowers. Chief among the former, a quince-like golden sphere, that filled the air with such fragrance, you thought you were tasting its flavor. Nor did the wine cease flowing. That day, the juam grape did bleed. That day the tendril ringlets of the vines did all uncurl and grape by grape in sheer dismay. The sun-ripe clusters dropped. Grape-glad were five-and-twenty kings. Five-and-twenty kings were merry. Morando's vintage had no end, nor other liquids in the royal cellar stored, somewhere secret in the grot. Oh, where's the endless Niger's source? Search ye here or search ye there. On, on, through ravine, vega vale. No headwaters will ye find, but why need gain the hidden spring when its lavish stream flows by? At threefold mouths that delta grot discharged, rivers golden, white, and red. But who may sing for I? Down I come, and light upon the old and prosy plain. Among other decanters set afloat was a pompous, lordly-looking demijohn, but old and reverend withal, that sailed about, consequential as an autocrat going to be crowned or a treasure-freighted argosy bound home before the wind. It looked solemn, however, though it reeled, peradventure far gone with its own potent contents. O oh, russet shores of Rhine and Rhone, O oh, mellow memories of ripe old vintages, O oh, cobwebs in the pyramids, O oh, dust on Pharaoh's tomb, all, all recur as I bethink me of that glorious gourd, its contents cogent as Tokay, itself as old as Mohi's legends, more venerable to look at, then his beard. Whence came it? Buried in vases, so saith the label, and the heart of old Majora, now dead, one hundred thousand moons. Exhumed at last, it looked no wine, but was shrunk into a subtle syrup. This special calabash was distinguished by numerous trappings, caparisoned like the sacred bay steed, led before the great Khan of Tartary. A most curious and betasseled network encased it, and the royal lizard was jealously twisted about its neck like a hand on a throat, containing some invaluable secret. All hail Marzilla, king's own royal particular, of Venice Percy, dating back to the conquest, distilled of yore from purple berries, growing in the purple valley of Ardair, thrice hail. But the imperial Marzilla was not for all, gods only could partake, the kings and demigods of the isles, excluding left-handed descendants of sad rakes of immortals, 
in old times breaking heads and hearts in Mardi, bequeathing bars sinister to many mortals, who now in vain might urge a claim to a cupful of right regal Marzilla. The royal particular was pressed upon me, by the now jovial Don Gilolo. With his own sceptred hand, charging my flagon to the brim, he declared his despotic pleasure, that I should quaff it off to the last lingering globule. No hard calamity, truly, for the drinking of this wine was as the singing of a mighty ode, or frenzied lyric to the soul. Drink, Taji, cried Don Gilolo, drink deep. In this wine a king's heart is dissolved. Drink long. In this wine lurk the seeds of the life everlasting. Drink deep, drink long. Thou drinkest wisdom and valor at every draught. Drink forever, O Taji, for thou drinkest that which will enable thee to stand up and speak out before mighty Oro himself. Borabola, he added, turning round upon the domed old king at his left, was it not the god Zepho who begged of my great-great-grandsire a draught of this same wine, saying that he was about to beget a hero? Even so, and thy glorious Marzilla produced thrice valiant O Nona, who slew the giants of the reef. Ha, ha, hearest that, O Taji? And Angelolo drained another cup. Amazing! the flexibility of the royal elbow and the rigidity of the royal spine, more especially as we had been impressed with a notion of their debility, but sometimes these seemingly enervated young blades approve themselves steadier of limb than veteran revellers of very long standing. Discharge the basin and refill it with wine, cried Don Gilolo. Break all empty gourds, drink kings, and dash your cups at every draught. So saying, he started from his purple mat, and with one foot planted unknowingly upon the skull of Marjora, while all the skeletons grinned at him from the pavement, Don Gilolo, holding on high his blood-red goblet, burst forth with the following invocation. Ha-ha, gods and kings fill high, one and all drink, drink, shout and drink, mad respond to the call, fill fast and fill frill, against the goblet ne'er sin, quaff there at high tide, to the uttermost rim, flood-tide and soul-tide, to the brim. Who with wine in him fears? Who thinks of his cares? Who sighs to be wise when wine in him flares? Water sinks down below, in currents full slow, but wine mounts on high with its genial glow welling up till the brain overflow. As the spheres with a roll, some fiery of soul, others golden with music, revolve round the pole. So let our cups radiant with many-hued wines, round and round in group circles, our zodiac signs round reeling and ringing their chimes. Then drink, gods and kings, wine merriment brings, it bounds through the veins, there, jubilant sings, let it ebb then and flow, wine never grows dim, drain down that bright tide at the foam-beaded rim, fill up every cup to the brim. Caught by all present, the chorus resounded again and again. The beaded wine danced on many a beard, the cataract lifted higher its voice, the grotto sent back a shout, the ghosts of the coral monarchs seemed starting from their insulated bones. But ha, 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 roared forth the five and twenty kings, alive, not dead, holding both hands to their girdles, and baying out their laughter from abysses, like Nimrod's hounds over some fallen elk. Mad and crazy revelers, how ye drank and roared, but kings no more, vestures loosed, and scepters rolling on the ground. Glorious agrarian thou wine, bringing all hearts on a level, and at last all legs to the earth, even those of kings, who, to do them justice, have been much maligned for imputed qualities, not theirs. For whoso has touched flagons with monarchs, bear they their backbones never so stiffly on the throne, well know the rascals to be at bottom royal good fellows, capable of a vinous frankness exceeding that of base-born men. Was not Alexander a boon companion? And daft Cambyses? And what of old Rowley? as good a judge of wine and other matters as ever sipped claret or kisses. If ever Taji joins a club, let it be a beefsteak club of kings. Don Gilolo emptied another cup. The mirth now blew a gale, like a ship's shrouds in a typhoon. Every tendon vibrated. The breezes of Omi came forth with a rush. The hangings shook. The goblets danced fandangos, and Don Gilolo, clapping his hands, called before him his dancing women. Forth came from the grotto a reed-like burst of song, making all start and look that way to behold such enchanting strains. Sounds heralding sights, swimming in the air, emerged the nymphs, 
lustrous arms interlocked like Indian jugglers glittering snakes. Round the cascade they thronged, then paused in its spray. Of a sudden seemed to spring from its midst a young form of foam that danced into the soul like a thought. At last, sideways floating off, it subsided into the grotto, a wave. Evening drawing on apace, the crimson draperies were lifted and festooned to the arms of the idle pillars, admitting the rosy light of the even. Yielding to the reaction of the banquet, the kings now reclined, and two mute damsels entered, one with a gourd of scented waters, the other with napkins. Bending over Donjalolo's steaming head, the first let fall a shower of aromatic drops, slowly absorbed by her companion. Thus in turn all were served, nothing heard but deep breathing. In a marble vase they now kindled some incense, a handful of spices. Shortly after came three of the king's beautiful smokers, who, lighting their tubes at this odorous fire, blew over the company the sedative fumes of the Aina. Steeped in languor, I strove against it long, essayed to struggle out of the enchanted mist, but a siren hand seemed ever upon me, pressing me back. Half revealed as in a dream, and the last sight that I saw was Don Gilolo, eyes closed, face pale, locks moist, worn slowly to his sedan, to cross the hollow and wake in the seclusion of his harem. End of chapter 84。Chapter 85 After Dinner As in dreams, I behold thee again, Willamilla. As in dreams, once again, I stroll through thy cool, sandy groves. O oh, fairest of the valleys of Mardi, the thought of that mad merry feasting steals over my soul till I faint. Prostrate here and there, over the bones of Don Gilolo's sires, the royal bacchanals lay slumbering till noon. Which are the deadest? said Babalanja, peeping in. The live kings or the dead ones? But the former were drooping flowers, sought to be revived by watering. At intervals, the sedulous attendants went to and fro, besprinkling their heads with the scented contents of their vases. At length, one by one, the five-and-twenty kings lifted their ambrosial curls, and shaking the dew therefrom, like eagles, opened their right royal eyes, and dilated their aquiline nostrils, full upon the golden rays of the sun. But why absented himself Don Gilolo? Had he cavalierly left them to survive the banquet by themselves? But this apparent incivility was soon explained by heralds, announcing to their prone majesties that, through the over-solicitude of his slaves, their lord the king had been born to his harem, without being a party to the act. But to make amends, in his sedan, Don Gilolo was even now drawing nigh, not, however, again to make merry, but socially to sleep in company with his guests, for together they had all got high, and together they must all lie low. So at it they went, each king to his bones, and slumbered like heroes till evening, when, availing themselves of the cool moonlight approaching, the royal guests bade adieu to their host, and summoning their followers, quitted the glen. Early next day, having determined to depart for our canoes, we proceeded to the house of the morning, to take leave of Don Gilolo. An amazing change, one night of solitude and wrought. Pale and languid, we found him reclining, one hand on his throbbing temples. Near an overturned vessel of wine, the royal girdle lay tossed at his feet. He had waved off his frightened attendants, who crouched out of sight. We advanced. Do ye too leave me? Ready enough are ye to partake of my banquetings, which, to such as ye, are but mad incidents in one round of more tranquil diversions. But heed me not, Medea, I am mad, O oh, ye gods, or am I forever a captive? I, free king of Odo, when you list, condescend to visit the poor slave in Willamilla. I account them but charity your visits, would fain allure ye by sumptuous fare. Go, leave me, go, and be rovers again throughout blooming Mardi. For me, I am here for I. Bring me wine, slaves, quick, that I may pledge my guests fitfully. Alas, Medea, at the bottom of this cup are no sparkles as at the top. O oh, treacherous, treacherous friend, full of smiles and daggers. Yet for such as me, O oh, wine, thou art e'en a prop, though it pierce the side, for man must lean. Thou wine art the friend of the friendless, though a foe to all. King Medea, let us drink more cups. And now, farewell. 
Falling back, he averted his face, and silently we quitted the palace. End of chapter 85「Eighty Six of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eighty Six of Those Scamps, the Plugi. The beach gained, we embarked. In good time, our party recovered from the seriousness into which we had been thrown, and a rather long passage being now before us, we whiled away the hours as best we might. Among many entertaining narrations, old Braidbeard, crossing his calves and peeking his beard, regaled us with some account of certain invisible spirits, eclipsed the plugi, errant little knaves, as ever gulped moonshine. They were spoken of as inhabiting the island of Quelquo in a remote corner of the lagoon, the innocent people of which island were sadly fretted and put out by their diabolical proceedings. Not to be wondered at, since, Dwelling as they did in the air and completely inaccessible, these spirits were peculiarly provocative of ire. Detestable plugi. With malice aforethought, they brought about high winds that destroyed the banana plantations and tumbled over the heads of its occupants many a bamboo dwelling. They cracked the calabashes, soured the poi, induced the colic, begat the spleen, and almost rent people in twain with stitches inside. In short, from whatever evil, the cause of which the islanders could not directly impute to their gods, or in their own opinion was not referable to themselves, of that very thing must the invisible plugi be guilty. With horrible dreams and bloodthirsty gnats, they invaded the most innocent slumbers. All things they bedeviled. A man with a wry neck ascribed it to the plugi. He with a bad memory railed against the plugi, and the boy, bruising his finger, also cursed those abominable spirits. Nor to some minds, at least, was there wanting strong presumptive evidence that at times, with invisible fingers, the above-mentioned plugi did leave direct and tangible traces of their presence, pinching and pounding the unfortunate islanders, pulling their hair, plucking their ears, and tweaking their beards and their noses, and thus perpetually vexing, incensing, tormenting, and exasperating their helpless victims. The atrocious plugi reveled in their malicious dominion over the souls and bodies of the people of Quelquo. What it was that induced them to enact such a part, Oro only knew, and never but once, it seems, did old Mohi endeavor to find out. Once upon a time, visiting Quoquo, he chanced to encounter an old woman almost doubled together, both hands upon her abdomen, in that manner running about distracted. My good woman, said he, what under the firmament is the matter? The plugi, the plugi, affectionately caressing the field of their operations. But why do they torment you? he soothingly inquired. How should I know, and what good would it do me if I did? And on she ran. At this part of his narration, Mohi was interrupted by Medea, who, much to the surprise of all present, observed that, unbeknown to him, Braidbeard, he happened to have been on that very island at that very time, and saw that identical old lady in the very midst of those abdominal tribulations. That she was really in great distress, he went on to say, was plainly to be seen, but that in that particular instance your plugi had any hand in tormenting her, I had some boisterous doubts, for hearing that an hour or two previous she had been partaking of some twenty unripe bananas, I rather fancied that that circumstance might have had something to do with her sufferings. When, however it was, all the herb leeches on the island would not have altered her own opinions on the subject. No, said Braidbeard, a post-mortem examination would not have satisfied her ghost. Curious to relate, he continued, the people of that island never abuse the plugi, notwithstanding all they suffer at their hands, unless under direct provocation, and a settled matter of faith is it, that at such times all bitter words and hasty objurgations are entirely overlooked, nay, pardoned, on the spot, by the unseen genie against whom they are directed. Magnanimous plugi, cried Medea, but Babalanja, to you who run a tilt at all things, suffer this silly conceit to be uttered with impunity in your presence? Why so silent? I have been thinking, my lord, said Babalanja, that though the people of that island may at times err in imputing their calamities to the plugi, that nevertheless upon the whole they indulge in a reasonable belief, for plugi or no plugi, it is undeniable that in ten thousand ways, as if by a malicious agency we mortals are woefully put out and tormented, 
and that, too, by things in themselves so exceedingly trivial, that it would seem almost impiety to ascribe them to the august gods. No, there must exist some greatly inferior spirits, so insignificant, comparatively, as to be overlooked by the supernatural powers, and through them it must be that we are thus grievously annoyed. At any rate, such a theory would supply a hiatus in my system of metaphysics. Well, peace to the Plugi, said Medea. They trouble not me. End of chapter 86Chapter 87 of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 87, Nora Bamba. Still onward gliding, the lagoon a calm. Hours pass, and full before us, round and green, a Moslem turban by us floats. Nora Bamba, Isle of Nods. Noontide rolls its flood, vibrates the air and trembles and by illusion optical, thin draped in azure haze, drift here and there the brilliant lands, swans, peacock-plumed, sailing through the sky. Down to earth hath heaven come, hard-telling sun-clouds from the isles. And high in air nods Norabamba, nid nods its tufted summit, like three ostrich plumes, its beetling crags, bent poppies, shadows, willowy shores, all nod. Its streams are murmuring down the hills, its wavelets hush the shore. Who dwells in Norabamba? Dreamers, hypochondriacs, somnambulists. Who, from the cark and care of outer Mardi fleeing, in the poppy's jaded odors, seek oblivion for the past, and ecstasies to come? Open-eyed, they sleep and dream on their roof trees, grapes unheeded drop. In Norabamba, whispers are as shouts, and at a zephyr's breath, from the woodlands, shake the leaves, as of hummingbirds, a flight. All this spake Braidbeer of the isle. Now that none e'er touched its strand without rendering instant tribute of a nap, how that those who thither voyaged in golden quest of golden gourds fast dropped to sleep, ere one was plucked, waking not till night, how that you must needs rub hard your eyes, you would wander through the isle, and how that silent spectres could be met, haunting twilight groves and dreamy meads, hither gliding, thither fading, end or purpose none, true or false, so much for Mohis nor Obama. But as we floated on, it looked the place described. We yawned and yawned, as crews of vessels may, as in warm Indian seas their winnowing sails all swoon, when by them glides some opium argosy. End of chapter 87 Chapter 88 of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 88. In a calm, how Tia's heralds approach. How still, cried Babalanja, this calm is like unto Oro's everlasting serenity, and like unto man's last despair. But now the silence was broken by a strange, distant, intermittent melody in the water. Gazing over the side, we saw naught but a far-darting ray in its depths. Then Yumi, before buried in a reverie, burst forth with a verse, sudden as a jet from a geyser. Like the fish of the bright and twittering fin, bright fish, diving deep as high soars the lark, so far, 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 doth a maiden swim, wild song, wild light, in still oceans dark. What maiden, minstrel? cried Medea. None of these, answered Yumi, pointing out a shallop gliding near. The damsels three, Taji, they pursue you yet. That still canoe drew nigh, the iris in its prow. Gliding slowly by, one damsel flung a Venus car, the leaves yet fresh. Said Yumi, fly to love. The second maiden flung a pallid blossom, buried in hemlock leaves. Said Yumi, starting, I have wrought a death. Then came showering Venus cars and glorious moss roses, numberless and odorous handfuls of verbena. Said Yumi, yet fly, oh, fly to me. All rosy joys and sweets are mine. Then the damsels floated on. Was ever queen more enigmatical? cried Medea. Love, death, joy, fly to me. But what says Taji? That I turn not back for how Tia, whoe'er she be, that wild witch I contemn. Then spread our pinions wide, a breeze, up sails, ply paddles all. Come, Flora's flute, float forth a song. 
to pieces picking the thorny roses called from Hautia's gifts, and holding up their blighted cores, thus plumed and turbaned, Yomi sang, leaning against the mast. O oh, royal is the rose, but barbed with many a dart. Beware, beware the rose, tis cankered at the heart. Sweet, sweet the sunny down, O oh, lily, lily, lily down. Sweet, sweet, verbena's bloom, O oh, pleasant, gentle, musky bloom. Dread, dread the sunny down. Lo, lily-hooded asp, blooms, blooms no more verbena, white withered in your clasp. End of chapter 88「Eighty Nine of Marty and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eighty Nine Braid Beard Rehearses the Origin of the Isle of Rogues. Judge not things by their names. Thus the maxim illustrated respecting the isle towards which we were sailing. Ohonu was its designation, in other words, the land of rogues. So what but a nest of villains and pirates could one fancy it to be? A downright tortuga swarming with brethren of the coast, such as Montbars, Lolone, Bartholomew, Peter of Dieppe, and desperados of that kidney. But not so. The men of Ohonu were as honest as any in Mardi. They had a suspicious appellative for their island, true, but not thus seemed it to them. For upon nothing did they so much plume themselves as upon this very name. Why? Its origins went back to the old times, and being venerable, they glorified therein, though they disclaimed its present applicability to any of their race, showing that words are but algebraic signs, conveying no meaning except what you please, and to be called one thing is oftentimes to be another. But how came the Oonus by their name? Listen, and Braidwill, our Herodotus, will tell. Long and long ago, there were banished to Ohonu all the buccaneers, flybustiers, thieves, and malefactors of the neighboring islands, who, becoming at last quite a numerous community, resolved to make a stand for their dignity, and number one among the nations of Mahdi. And even as before they had been weeded out of the surrounding countries, so now they went to weeding out themselves, banishing all objectionable persons to still another island. These events happened at a period so remote that at present it was uncertain whether those twice banished were thrust into their second exile by reason of their superlative knavery or because of their comparative honesty. If the latter, then must the residue have been a precious enough set of scoundrels. However it was, the commonwealth of knaves now mustered together their grey beards and wise pates and knowing ones, of which last there was a plenty, chose a king to rule over them, and went to political housekeeping for themselves. And in the fullness of time this people became numerous and mighty, and the more numerous and mighty they waxed, by so much the more did they take pride and glory in their origin, frequently reverting to it with manifold boastings. The proud device of their monarch was a hand with the forefinger crooked, emblematic of the peculatory propensities of his ancestors. And all this at greater length, said Mohi. It would seem then, my lord, said Babalanja, reclining, as if these men of Ohonu had canonized the derelictions of their progenitors, though the same traits are deemed scandalous among themselves. But it is time that makes the difference. The knave of a thousand years ago seems a fine old fellow full of spirit and fun, little malice in his soul, whereas the knave of to-day seems a sour-visaged white, with nothing to redeem him. Many great scoundrels of our chronicler's chronicles are heroes to us, witness Majora the usurper. Ay, time truly works wonders. It sublimates wine, it sublimates fame, nay, is the creator thereof. It enriches and darkens our spears of the palm, enriches and enlightens the mind. It ripens cherries and young lips." festoons old ruins and ivy's old heads, imparts a relish to old yams and a pungency to the ponderings of old Bardiana, of fables distills truths and finally smooths, levels, glosses, softens, melts, and meliorates all things. Why, my lord, round Mardi itself is all the better for its antiquity and the more to be revered, to the cozy-minded more comfortable to dwell in. Ah, if ever it lay in embryo, like a green seed in the pod, what a damp, 
shapeless thing it must have been, and how unpleasant from the traces of its recent creation. The first man, quoth old Bardiana, must have felt like one going into a new habitation, where the bamboos are green. Is there not a legend in Marama that his family were long troubled with influenzas and catars? Oh, time, 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 cried Yumi. It is time, old midsummer time, that has made the old world what it is. Time hoarded the old mountains, and balded their old summits, and spread the old prairies, and built the old forests, and molded the old vales. It is time that has worn glorious old channels for the glorious old rivers, and rounded the old lakes, and deepened the old sea. It is time. I full time to cease, cried Medea. What have you to do with cogitations not in verse, minstrel? Leave prose to Babalanja, who is prosy enough. Even so, said Babalanja, Yumi, you have overstepped your province. My lord Medea well knows that your business is to make the metal in you jingle in tags, not ring in the ingot. End of chapter 89「Ninety of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Ninety Rare Sport at Ohonu. Approached from the northward, Ohonu, midway cloven down to the sea, one half a level plain, the other three mountain terraces. Ohonu looks like the first steps of a gigantic way to the sun. And such, if Braidbeard spoke the truth, it had formerly been. Ere Mardi was made, said that true old chronicler, Vivo, one of the genii, built a ladder of mountains whereby to go up and to go down. And of this ladder, the island of Ohonu was the base. But wandering here and there, the incognito in a vapor, in so much wickedness did Vivo spy out, that in high dudgeon he hurried up his ladder, knocking the mountains from under him as he went. These here and there fell into the lagoon, forming many isles now green and luxuriant, which with those sprouting from seeds dropped by a bird from the moon comprise all the groups in the reef. Surely, oh, surely, if I live till Marty be forgotten by Marty, I shall not forget the sight that greeted us as we drew nigh the shores of this same island of Ohonu, for was not all Ohonu bathing in the surf of the sea? But let the picture be painted." Where eastward the ocean rolls surging against the outer reef of Mardi, there, facing a floodgate in the barrier, stands cloven Ohunu, her plains sloping outward to the sea, her mountains as a bulwark behind. As at Juam, where the wild billows from seaward roll in upon its cliffs, much more at Ohunu, in billowy battalions charge they hotly into the lagoon and fall on the isle like an army from the deep. But charge they never so boldly, and charge they forever old Ahunu gallantly throws them back, till all before her is one scud and rack. So charged the bright billows of cuirassiers at Waterloo. So hurled them off the long line of living walls, whose base was at the sea-beach, wreck strown in a gale. Without the break in the reef, wide banks of coral shelve off, creating the bar, where the waves muster for the onset, thundering in water-bolts that shake the whole reef, till its very spray trembles. And then is it, that the swimmers of Ohonu most delight to gamble in the surf. For this sport, a surfboard is indispensable, some five feet in length, the width of a man's body, convex on both sides, highly polished and rounded at the ends. It is held in high estimation, invariably oiled after use, and hung up conspicuously in the dwelling of the owner. Ranged on the beach, the bathers, by hundreds, dash in, and diving under the swells, make straight for the outer sea, pausing not till the comparatively smooth expanse beyond has been gained. Here, throwing themselves upon their boards, tranquilly they wait for a billow that suits. Snatching them up, it hurries them landward, volume and speed both increasing, till it races along a watery wall, like a smooth, awful verge of Niagara. Hanging over this scroll, looking down from it, as from a precipice, the bathers halloo, every limb in motion to preserve their place on the very crest of the wave. Should they fall behind, the squadrons that follow would whelm them, dismounted, and thrown forward, as certainly would they be run over by the steed they ride. Tis like charging at the head of cavalry. You must on. An expert swimmer shifts his position on his plank, now half striding it, 
and anon, like a rider in the ring, poising himself upright in the scud, coming on like a man in the air. At last all is lost in scud and vapour, as the overgrown billow bursts like a bomb. Adroitly emerging, the swimmers thread their way out, and like seals at the Orkneys, stand dripping upon the shore. Landing in smooth water, some distance from the scene, we strolled forward, and meeting a group resting, inquired for Uhia, their king. He was pointed out in the foam, but presently drawing nigh, he embraced Medea, bidding all welcome. The bathing over, and evening at hand, Uhia and his subjects repaired to their canoes, and we to ours. Landing at another quarter of the island, we journeyed up a valley called Monlova, and were soon housed in a very pleasant retreat of our host. Soon supper was spread, but though the viands were rare, and the red wine went round and round, like a foaming bay horse in the ring, yet we marked that despite the stimulus of his day's good sport, and the stimulus of his brave good cheer, Uhia, our host, was moody and still. Said Babalanja, My lord, he fills wine cups for others to quaff but whispered King Medea, Though Uhia be sad, be we merry, merry men. And merry some were, and merrily went to their mats. End of chapter 90of King Uhia and his subjects. As beseemed him, Uhia was royally lodged, ample his roof. Beneath it a hundred attendants nightly laid their heads, but long since he had disbanded his damsels. Springing from siren embrace, they shall sap and mine me no more, he cried. My destiny commands me, I will don my manhood. By Kiwi, no more will I clasp a waist. From that time forth, said Braidbeard, young Uhia spread like the tufted top of the palm. His thigh grew brawny as the limb of the banyan, his arm waxed strong as the backbone of the shark, yea, his voice grew sonorous as a conch. And now he bent his whole soul to the accomplishment of the destiny believed to be his. Nothing less than bodily to remove Ohono to the center of the lagoon, in fulfillment of an old prophecy running thus, when a certain island shall stir from its foundations and stand in the middle of the still water, then shall the ruler of that island be ruler of all Mardi. The task was hard, but how glorious the reward! So at it he went, and all Ohuno helped him, not by hands, but by calling in the magicians, thus far nevertheless in vain. But Uhia had hopes. Now informed of all this, said Babalanja to Medea, My lord, if the continual looking forward to something greater be better than an acquiescence in things present, then, wild as it is, this belief of Uhia's he should hug to his heart, as erewhile his wives. But, my lord, this faith it is that robs his days of peace, his nights of sweet consciousness. For holding himself foreordained to the dominion of the entire archipelago, he upbraids the gods for laggards and curses himself as deprived of his rights, nay, as having had wrested from him what he never possessed. Discontent dwarfs his horizon till he spans it with his hand. Most miserable of demigods, he cries, here am I cooped up in this insignificant island, only one hundred leagues by fifty, when scores of broad empires own me not for their lord. Yet Uhia himself is envied. Ah, cries Carolono, one of his chieftains, master of a snug little glen, here am I cabined in this paltry cell among the mountains, when that king Uhia is lord of the whole island, and every cubic mile of matter therein. But this same Carolono is envied. Hard, O oh, beggarly, lot is mine, cries Dono, one of his retainers. Here am I fixed and screwed down to this paltry plantation, when my lord Carolono owns the whole glen, ten long parasangs from cliff to sea. But Dono too is envied. Alas, cursed fate, cries his servitor Flavona. Here am I made to trudge, sweat, and labor all day, when Dono, my master, does nothing but command. But others envy Flavono, and those who envy him are envied in turn, even down to poor Bedrin and Manta, who, dying of want, groans forth. Abandoned wretch that I am, here I miserably perish, while so many beggars gad about and live. But surely none envy Manta. Yes, great Uhia himself. 
ah cries the king here am i vexed and tormented by ambition no peace night nor day my temples chafed sore by this cursed crown that i wear while that ignoble white manta gives up the ghost with none to molest him in vain we wandered up and down in the aisle and peered into its innermost recesses no yilla was there End of chapter ninety one chapter ninety two of mahdi and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 92. The God Kivi and the Precipice of Mondo. One object of interest in Ohonu was the original image of Kivi, the God of Thieves. Hence, from time immemorial, the tutelar deity of the isle. His shrine was a natural niche in a cliff, walling in the valley of Monlova. And here stood Kivi, with his five eyes, ten hands, and three pairs of legs, equipped at all points for the vocation over which he presided. Of mighty girth his arms terminated in hands, every finger a limb, spreading in multiplied digits, palm twice five, and fifty fingers. According to the legend, Kivi fell from a golden cloud, burying himself to the thighs in the earth, tearing up the soil all around. Three meditative mortals, strolling by at the time, had a narrow escape. A wonderful recital, but none of us voyagers durst flout it. Did they not show us the identical spot where the idol fell? We descended into the hollow, now verdant. Questionless, Kivi himself would have vouched for the truth of the miracle, had he not been unfortunately dumb. But by far the most cogent and pointed argument advanced in support of this story is a spear which the priests of Kivi brought forth for Babalanja to view. Let me look at it closer, said Babalanja and turning it over and over and curiously inspecting it. Wonderful spear, he cried. Doubtless, my reverence, this self-same spear must have persuaded many recusants. Nay, the most stubborn, they answered. And all afterward quoted as additional authority for the truth of the legend? Assuredly. From the sea to the shrine of this god, the fine valley of Monlova ascends with a gentle gradation, hardly perceptible, but upon turning toward the water, one is surprised to find himself high elevated above its surface. Pass on, and the same silent ascent deceives you, and the valley contracts, and on both sides the cliffs advance, till at last you come to a narrow space, shouldered by buttresses of rock. Beyond, through this cleft, all is blue sky. If the trades blow high, and you came unawares upon the spot, you would think Kivi himself pushing you forward with all his hands, so powerful is the current of air rushing through this elevated defile. But expostulate not with the tornado that blows you along. Sail on, but soft, look down. The land breaks off in one sheer descent of a thousand feet right down to the wide plain below. So sudden and profound this precipice that you seem to look off from one world to another. In a dreamy, sunny day, the spangled plain beneath assumes an uncertain, fleeting aspect. Had you a deep-sea lead, you would almost be tempted to sound the ocean haze at your feet. This mortal is the precipice of Mondo. From this brink, spear in hand, sprang fifty rebel warriors, driven back into the vale by a superior force. Finding no spot to stand at bay, with a fierce shout, they took the fatal leap. Said Mohi, their souls ascended ere their bodies touched. This tragical event took place many generations gone by, and now a dizzy, devious way conducts one, firm afoot, from the verge to the plain, but none ever ascend. So perilous indeed is the descent itself, that the islanders venture not the feet without invoking supernatural aid. Flanking the precipice beneath beetling rocks stand the guardian deities of Mondo, and on altars before them are placed the propitiatory offerings of the traveller. To the right of the brink of the precipice, and far over it, projects a narrow ledge. The test of legitimacy in the Ohono monarchs is to stand here on, arms folded, and javelins darting by. And there in his youth Uhia stood. How felt you, cousin? asked Medea. Like the king of Ohono, he replied, as I shall again feel when king of all Mardi. End of chapter 92 Chapter 93 of Mahdi 
and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gail timmerman vaughan chapter ninety three babalanja steps in between mohi and yumi and yumi relates a legend embarking from ohunu we at length found ourselves gliding by the pleasant shores of tupia an islet which according to braidbeard had for ages remained uninhabited by man much curiosity being expressed to know more of the isle, Mohi was about to turn over his chronicles, when, with modesty, the minstrel Yumi interposed, saying that if my lord Medea permitted, he himself would relate the legend. From its nature, deeming the same pertaining to his province as poet, though as yet it had not been versified. But he added that true pearl shells ran musically, though not strung upon a chord. Upon this presumptuous interference, Mohi looked highly offended, and nervously twitching his beard, uttered something invidious about frippery young poetasters being too full of silly imaginings to tell a plain tale. Said Yumi in reply, adjusting his turban, Old Mohi, let us not clash. I honor your calling, but with submission, your chronicles are more wild than my cantos. I deal in pure conceits of my own, which have a shapelessness and a unity, however unsubstantial, but you, Braidbeard, deal in mangled realities. In all your chapters you yourself grope in the dark. Much truth is not in thee, historian. Besides, Mohi, my songs perpetuate many things which you sage scribes entirely overlook. Have you not oftentimes come to me, and my ever dewy ballads for information in which you and your musty old chronicles were deficient? In much that is precious mohi, we poets are the true historians, we embalm, you corrode. To this mohi, with some ire, was about to make an answer when, flinging over his shoulder a new fold of his mantle, Babalanja spoke thus, Peace, rivals! As Bardiana has it, like all who dispute upon pretensions of their own, you are each nearest the right when you speak of the other, and furthest therefrom when you speak of yourselves. Said Mohi and Yumi in a breath, Who sought your opinion, philosopher, you filcher from old Bardiana, and monger of maxims? You, who have so long marked the vices of Mardi, that you flatter yourselves, you have none of your own, added Braidbeard. You, who only seem wise, because of the contrasting follies of others, and not of any great wisdom in yourself, continued the minstrel, with unwanted asperity. Now here, said Babalanja, am I charged upon a bearded old ram and a lamb, one butting with his curious and brittle old frontlet, the other pushing with his silly head before its horns are sprouted. But this comes of being impartial. Had I espoused the cause of Yumi versus Mohi, or that of Mohi versus Yumi, I had been sure to have had at least one voice in my favor. The impartialist insulteth all sides, saith old Bardiana but smite with but one hand, and the other shall be kissed. Oh, incomparable Bardiana! Will no one lay that troubled old ghost? exclaimed Medea devoutly. Proceed with thy legend, Yumi, and see to it that it be brief, for I mistrust me. These legends do but test the patience of the hearers. But draw a long breath, and begin. A long bow, muttered Mohi. And Yumi began. It is now about ten hundred thousand moons. Great Oro, how long since, you say? cried Mohi, making gothic arches of his brows. Looking at him disdainfully, but vouchsafing no reply, Yumi began over again. It is now above ten hundred thousand moons, since there died the last of a marvellous race, once inhabiting the very shores by which we are sailing. They were a very diminutive people, only a few inches high. Stop, minstrel, cried Mohi. How many pennyweights did they weigh? Continued Yumi, unheedingly. They were covered all over with a soft, silky down, like that on the rind of the avi, and there grew upon their heads a green, lance-leaved vine of a most delicate texture. For convenience, the mannequins reduced their tendrils, sporting nothing but coronals. Whereas priding themselves upon the redundancy of their tresses, the little maidens assiduously watered them with the early dew of the morning, so that all wreathed and festooned with verdure, they moved about in arbors, trailing after them trains. I can hear no more, exclaimed Mohi, stopping his ears. Continued Yumi, 
the damsel lured to their bowers certain red-plumaged insect birds and taught them to nestle therein and warble which with the pleasant vibrating of the leaves when the little maidens moved produced a strange blend of sweet singing sounds the little maidens embraced not with their arms but with their viny locks whose tendrils instinctively twined about their lovers till both were lost in the bower and what then asked mohi who notwithstanding the fingers in his ears somehow contrived to listen what then vouchsafing no reply yumi went on at a certain age but while yet the maidens were very young their vines bore blossoms ah fatal symptoms for soon as they burst the maidens died in their arbors and were buried in the valleys and their vines spread forth and the flowers bloomed but the maidens themselves were no more and now disdaining the earth the vines shot upward climbing to the topmost boughs of the trees and flowering in the sunshine for ever and i yumi here paused for a space but presently continued the little eyes of the people of tupi were very strange to behold full of stars that shone from within like the pleiades deep bosomed in blue and like the stars they were intolerant of sunlight and slumbering through the day the people of tupia only went abroad by night but it was chiefly when the moon was at full that they were mostly in spirits then the little mannequins would dive down into the sea and rove about in the coral groves making love to the mermaids or racing round make a mad merry night of it with the sea urchins plucking the reverend mullets by the beard serenading the turtles in their cells worrying the sea nettles or tormenting with their antics the touchy torpedoes sometimes they went prying about with the starfish that have an eye at the end of each ray and often with coral files in their hands stole upon slumbering swordfish slyly blunting their weapons in short these stout little mannequins were passionately fond of the sea and swore by wave and billow that sooner or later they would embark thereon in nautilus shells and spend the rest of their roving days thousands of inches from tupia too true they were shameless little rakes oft would they return to their sweethearts sporting musky girdles of sea kelp tasseled with green little pouches of grass brimful of seed pearls and jingling their coin in the ears of the damsels throw out innuendos about the beautiful and bountiful mermaids how wealthy and amorous they were and how they delighted in the company of the brave gallants of tupia ah at such heartless bravados how mourned the poor little nymphs deep into their arbors they went and their little hearts burst like rosebuds and filled the whole air with an odorous grief but when their lovers were gentle and true no happier maidens haunted the lilies than they by some mystical process they wrought minute balls of light touchy mercurial globules very hard to handle and with these at pitch and toss they played in the groves or mischievously inclined they toiled all night long at braiding the moonbeams together and entangling the plated end to a bough so that at night the poor planet had much ado to set here yumi once more was mute pause you to invent as you go on said old mohi elevating his chin till his head was horizontal yumi resumed little or nothing more my masters is extent of the legend only it must be mentioned that these little people were very tasteful in their personal adornings the mannequins wearing girdles of fragrant leaves and necklaces of aromatic seeds and the little damsels not content with their vines and their verdure sporting pearls in their ears bracelets of wee little porpoise teeth and oftentimes dancing with their mates in the moonlit glades coquettishly fanning themselves with the transparent wings of the flying fish now i appeal to you royal medea to you noble taji to you babalanja said the chronicler with an impressive gesture whether this seems a credible history yumi has invented but perhaps he has entertained old mohi said babalanja he has not spoken the truth persisted the chronicler mohi said babalanja truth is in things and not in words truth is voiceless so at least saith old bardiana and i babalanja assert that what are vulgarly called fictions are as much realities as the gross mattock of ddd the digger of trenches for things visible are but conceits of the eye things imaginative conceits of the fancy if duped by one we are equally duped by the other clear as this water said yumi opaque as this paddle said mohi but come now thou oracle if all things are deceptive tell us what is truth the old interrogatory did not they ask it 
when the world began, but ask it no more, as old Bardiana hath it, that question is more final than any answer. End of chapter 93「ninety four of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter ninety four of that jolly old lord, Borabola, and that jolly island of his, Mondolo, and of the fish ponds, and the hereafters of fish. Drawing near Mondolo, our next place of destination, we were greeted by six fine canoes gaily tricked out with streamers, and all alive with the gestures of their occupants. King Borabola and Court were hastening to welcome our approach. Medea, unbeknown to all, having notified him at the banquet of the twenty-five kings of our intention to visit his dominions. Soon, side by side, these canoes floated with ours, each barge of Odo courteously flanked by those of Mondolo. Not long were we in identifying Borabola the portly, pleasant old monarch, seated cross-legged upon a dais, projecting over the bow of the largest canoe of the six, close grappling to the side of the sea-elephant. Was he not a goodly round sight to behold? Round all over, round of eye and of head, and like the jolly round earth, roundest and biggest about the equator. A girdle of red was his equinoctial line, giving a compactness to his plumpness. This old Borabola permitted naught to come between his head and the sun, not even grey hairs. Bald as a gourd, right down to his brazen skull, the rays of the luminary converged. He was all hilarity, full of allusions to the feast at Willamilla, where he had done royal execution. Rare old Borabola, thou wert made for dining out, thy ample mouth an inlet for good cheer, and a sally-port for good humour. Bustling about on his dais, he now gave orders for the occupants of our canoes to be summarily emptied into his own, saying that in that manner only did he allow guests to touch the beach at Mondolo. So with no little trouble, for the waves were grown somewhat riotous, we proceeded to comply, bethinking ourselves all the while how annoying is sometimes an overstrained act of hospitality. We were now but little less than a mile from the shore, but what of that? There was plenty of time, thought Borabola, for a hasty lunch, and the getting of a subsequent appetite ere we effected a landing. So viands were produced, to which the guests were invited to pay heedful attention, or take the consequences, and famish till the long voyage in prospect was ended. Soon the water shoaled. Approaching land is like nearing truth in metaphysics, and ere we yet touched the beach, Borabola declared that we were already landed which paradoxical assertion implied that the hospitality of Mondolo was such that in all directions it radiated far out upon the lagoon, embracing a great circle, so that no canoe could sail by the island without its occupants being so long its guests. In most hospitable vicinity to the water was a fine large structure, enclosed by a stockade, both rather dilapidated, as if the cost of entertaining its guests prevented outlays for repairing the place but it was one of Borabola's maxims that generally your tumble-down old homesteads yield the most entertainment, their very dilapidation betoking their having seen good service in hospitality, whereas spruce-looking finical portals have a fizz full of meaning, for niggards are oft-times neat. Now, after all has been said, who's so silly as to fancy that because Borabola's mansion was enclosed by a stockade, that the same was intended as a defense against guests. By no means. In the palisade there was a mighty breach, not an entrance way, wide enough to admit six Daniel Lamberts abreast. Look, cried Borabola, as landing we stepped toward the place. Look, Medea, look all. These gates, you hear see, lashed back with osiers, have been so lashed during my lifetime. And just where they stand shall they rot, I they shall perish wide open. But why have them at all? inquired Medea. Ah, there you have old Borabola, cried the other. No, said Babalanja, a fence whose gate is ever kept open seems unnecessary, I grant. Nevertheless, it gives a notable hint, otherwise not so aptly conveyed, for is not the open gate the sign of the open heart? 
Right, right, cried Borabola. So enter both, cousin Medea. And with one hand smiting his chest, with the other he waved us on. But if the stockade seemed all open gate, the structure within seemed only a roof, for nothing but a slender pillar here and there supported it. This is my mode of building, said Borabola. I will have no outside to my palaces. Walls are superfluous. And to a high-minded guest, the entering a narrow doorway is like passing under a yoke. Every time he goes in or comes out, it reminds him that he is being entertained at the cost of another. So storm in all round. Within was one wide field bed, where reclining, we looked up to endless rows of brown calabashes and trenchers suspended along the rafters, promissory of ample cheer as regiments of old hams in a baronial refectory. They were replenished with both meat and drink, the trenchers readily accessible by means of cords, but with gourds containing a rack suspended neck downward were within easy reach where they swung. Seeing all these indications of hard roistering, like a cautious young bridegroom at his own marriage merrymaking, Taji stood his ground. And when Borabola urged him to empty a gourd or two, by way of making room in him for the incidental repast about to be served, Taji civilly declined, not wishing to cumber the floor before the cloth was laid. Jarl, however, yielding to importunity and unmindful of the unities of time and place, went freely about from gourd to gourd, concocting in him a punch at which Samoa expressed much surprise that he should be so unobservant as not to know that in Mardi guests might be pressed to demean themselves, without its being expected that so they would do. A true tosspot himself, he bowed his time. The second lunch over, Borobola placed both hands to the ground, and giving the sigh of the fat man, after three vigorous efforts, succeeded in gaining his pins, which pins of his were but small for his body, insomuch that they hugely staggered about under the fine old load they carried. The specific object of his thus striving after an erect posture was to put himself in motion and conduct us to his fish-ponds, famous throughout the archipelago as the hobby of the king of Mondolo. Furthermore, as the great repast of the day yet to take place was to be a grand piscatory one, our host was all anxiety that we should have a glimpse of our fish, while yet alive and hearty. We were alarmed at perceiving that certain servitors were preparing to accompany us with trenchers of edibles. It begat the notion that our trip to the fish-ponds was to prove a long journey. But they were not three hundred yards distant, though Borabola, being a veteran traveller, never stirred from his abode without his battalion of butlers. The ponds were four in number, close bordering the water, embracing about an acre each, and situated in a low fen, draining several valleys. The excavated soil was thrown up in dikes, made tight by being beaten all over, while in the soft state, with the heavy flat ends of palm stalks. Lying side by side, by three connecting trenches, these ponds could be made to communicate at pleasure, while two additional canals afforded means of letting in upon them the salt waters of the lagoon on one hand, and those of an inland stream on the other and by a third canal with four branches, together or separately, they could be partially drained. Thus, the waters could be mixed to suit any gills, and the young fish taken from the sea passed through a stated process of freshening, so that by the time they graduated, the salt was well out of them, like the brains out of some diplomaed collegians. Freshwater fish are only to be obtained in Mondolo by the artificial process above mentioned, as the streams and brooks abound not in trout or other Waltonian prey. Taken all floundering from the sea, Borobola's fish, passing through their regular training for the table, and daily tended by their keepers, in course of time became quite tame and communicative, to prove which, calling his head ranger, the king bade him administer the customary supply of edibles. Accordingly, mouthfuls were thrown into the ponds, whereupon the fish darted in a shoal toward the margin some leaping out of the water in their eagerness. Crouching on the bank, the ranger now called several by name, patted their scales, carrying on some heathenish nursery talk, like St. Anthony in ancient Coptic, instilling virtuous principles into his finny flock on the seashore. But alas, for the hair-shirted old Dominique's backsliding disciples. For of all nature's animated kingdoms, fish, 
are the most unchristian, inhospitable, heartless, and cold-blooded of creatures. At least, so seem they to strangers, though at bottom somehow they must be all right. And truly, it is not to be wondered at that the very reverend Anthony strove after the conversion of fish, for whoso shall Christianize, and by so doing humanize the sharks, will do a greater good by the saving of human life in all time to come, than though he made catchments of the head-hunting Dyaks of Borneo, or the blood-bidding Batas of Sumatra. And are these Dyaks and Batas one whit better than tiger-sharks? Nay, are they so good? Were a Bata your intimate friend, you would often mistake an orangutan for him, and have orangutans immortal souls. True, the Batas believe in a hereafter, but of what sort? Full of bluebeards and bloody bones. So also the sharks, who hold that paradise is one vast Pacific, ploughed by navies of mortals, whom an endless gale forever drops into their maws. Not wholly a surmise, for does it not appear a little unreasonable to imagine that there is any creature, fish, flesh, or fowl, so little in love with life, as not to cherish hopes of a future state? Why does man believe in it? One reason, reckoned cogent, is that he desires it. Who shall say, then, that the leviathan this day harpooned on the coast of Japan goes not straight to his ancestor, who rolled all Jonah as a sweet morsel under his tongue? Though herein some sailors are slow believers, or at best hold themselves in a state of philosophical suspense. Say they, that catastrophe took place in the Mediterranean, and the only whales frequenting the Mediterranean are of a sort not having a swallow large enough to pass a man entire for those Mediterranean whales feed upon small things, as horses upon oats. But hence the sailors draw a rash inference. Are not the Straits of Gibraltar wide enough to admit a sperm whale, even though none have sailed through since Nineveh and the gourd in its suburbs dried up? As for the possible hereafter of the whales, a creature eighty feet long without stockings, and thirty feet round the waist before dinner, is not inconsiderately to be consigned to annihilation. End of chapter 94。Chapter 95 of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 95. That jolly old Lord Borobola laughs on both sides of his face. A very good palace this cause for you and me said waddling old Borobola to Medea as, returning from our excursion, he slowly lowered himself down to his mat, sighing like a grampus. By this, he again made known the vastness of his hospitality, which led him for the nonce to parcel out his kingdom with his guests. But apart from these extravagant expressions of good feeling, Borobola was the prince of good fellows. His great ton of a person was indispensable to the housing of his bullock heart, under which any lean weight would have sunk. But alas, unlike Medea and Taji, Borobola, though a crowned king, was accounted no demigod, his obesity excluding him from that honor. Indeed, in some quarters of Mardi, certain pagans maintain that no fat man can be even immortal. A dogma, truly, which should be thrown to the dogs. For fat men are the salt and savor of the earth, full of good humor, high spirits, fun, and all manner of jollity. Their breath clears the atmosphere, their exaltations air the world. Of men, they are the good measures, brimmed, heaped, pressed down, piled up, and running over. They are as ships from Tenerife, swimming deep, full of old wine, and twenty steps down into their holds, soft and susceptible, all round they are easy of entreaty. Wherefore, for all their rotundity, they are too often circumnavigated by hatchet-faced knaves. Ah, a fat uncle with a fat paunch and a fat purse is a joy and a delight to all nephews, to philosophers a subject of endless speculation as to how many droves of oxen and Lake Eries of wine might have run through his great mill during the full term of his mortal career. Fat men not immortal, this very instant old Lambert is rubbing his jolly abdomen in paradise. Now, to the fact of his not being rated a demigod, was perhaps ascribable the circumstance that Borobola comported himself with less dignity than was the want of their Median majesties. And truth to say, 
to have seen him regaling himself with one of his favorite cuttlefish, its long snaky arms and feelers instinctively twining round his head. As he ate, few intelligent observers would have opined that the individual before them was the sovereign lord of Bondolo. But what of the banquet of fish? Shall we tell how the old king ungirdled himself there, too? How is the feast waxed toward its close? With one sad exception, he still remained sunny-sided all round, his disc of a face joyous as the south side of Madeira in a hilarious season of grapes. Shall we tell how we all grew glad and frank, and how the din of the dinner was heard far into the night? We will. When Medea ate slowly, Borabola took him to task, bidding him dispatch his viands more speedily. Whereupon said Medea, but Borabola, my round fellow, that would abridge the pleasure. Not at all, my dear demigod, do like me, eat fast and eat long. In the middle of the feast a huge skin of wine was brought in. The portly peltry of a goat, its horns embattling its effigy head, its mouth the nozzle, and its long beard flowed to its jet-black hoofs. With many ceremonial salams, the attendants bore it along, placing it at one end of the convivial mats, full in front of Borabola, where seated upon its haunches, it made one of the party. Brimming a ram's horn, the mellowest of bugles, Borabola bowed to his silent guest, and thus spoke. In this wine, which yet smells of the grape, I pledge you, my reverent old toper, my lord Capricornus, you alone have enough, and here's full skins to the rest. How jolly he is, whispered Medea to Babalanja. Ay, his lungs laugh loud, but is laughing rejoicing. Help, help, cried Borabola, lay me down, lay me down. Good gods, what a twinge! The goblet fell from his hand, the purple flew from his wine to his face, and Borabola fell back into the arms of his servitors. That gout, that gout, he groaned. Lord, Lord, no more cursed wine will I drink. Then at ten paces distant a clumsy attendant let fall a trencher. Take it off my foot, you knave. Afar off another entered gallanting a calabash. Look out for my toe, you hound. During all this the attendants tenderly nursed him, and in good time, with its thousand fangs, the gout fiend departed for a while. Reprieved, the old king brightened up, by degrees becoming jolly as ever. Come, let us be merry again, he cried. What shall we eat, and what shall we drink? That infernal gout is gone. Come, what will your worships have? So at it once more we went. But of our feast little more remains to be related than this, that out of it grew a wondrous kindness between Borabola and Jarl. Strange to tell, from the first our fat host had regarded my Viking with a most friendly eye. Still stranger to add, this feeling was returned, but though they thus fancied each other, they were very unalike, Borabola and Jarl. Nevertheless, thus is it ever, and as the convex fits not into the convex, but into the concave, so do men fit into their opposites, and so fitted Borabola's arched paunch into Jarl's, hollowed out to receive it. But how now? Borabola was jolly and loud, Jarl demure and silent. Borabola was a king, Jarl only a viking. How came they together? Very plain to repeat, because they were heterogeneous, and hence the affinity but as the affinity between those chemical opposites chlorine and hydrogen is promoted by caloric, so the affinity between Borabola and Jarl was promoted by the warmth of the wine that they drank at this feast. For of all blessed fluids, the juice of the grape is the greatest foe to cohesion. True, it tightens the girdle, but then it loosens the tongue and opens the heart. In sum, Borabola loved Jarl and Jarl, pleased with this sociable monarch for all his curiosity esteemed him the most sensible old gentleman and king he had as yet seen in Mardi. For this reason, perhaps, that his talkativeness favored that silence in listeners, which was my Viking's delight in himself. Repeatedly during the banquet our host besought Taji to allow his henchmen to remain on the island after the rest of our party should depart, and he faithfully promised to surrender Jarl whenever we should return to claim him. But though I harbored no distrust, of Borabola's friendly intentions. I could not so readily consent to his request, for with Jarl, for my one only companion, had I not both famished and feasted, was he not my only link to things past? Things past, ah, Yilla! 
for all its mirth, and though we hunted wide, we found thee not in Mondolo. End of chapter 95「ninety six of Mahdi and a Voyage through the Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter ninety six Samoa a Surgeon. The second day of our stay in Mondolo was signalized by a noteworthy exhibition of the surgical skill of Samoa, who had often boasted that though well versed in the science of breaking men's heads, he was equally an adept in mending their crockery. Overnight, Borobola had directed his corps of sea-divers to repair early on the morrow to a noted section of the great Mardian Reef, for the purpose of procuring for our regalement some of the fine hawksbill turtle, whose secret retreats were among the cells and galleries of that submerged wall of coral, from whose foamy coping no plummet dropped ever yet touched bottom. These turtles were only to be obtained by diving far down under the surface, and then swimming along horizontally, and peering into the coral honeycomb, snatching at a flipper when seen, as at a pinion in a range of billing dovecoats. As the king's divers were thus employed, one of them, Carhono by name, perceived a devil-shark, so-called, swimming wistfully toward him out of his summer grotto in the reef. No way petrified by the sight, and pursuing the usual method adopted by these divers in such emergencies, Carhono, splashing the water, instantly swam toward the stranger. But the shark, undaunted, advanced, a thing so unusual and fearful that, in an agony of fright, the diver shot up for the surface. Heedless, he looked not up as he went, and when within a few inches of the open air dashed his head against a projection of the reef. He would have sank into the live tomb beneath, were it not that three of his companions, standing on the brink, perceived his peril and dragged him into safety. Seeing the poor fellow was insensible, they endeavoured ineffectually to revive him, and at last, placing him in their canoe, made all haste for the shore. Here a crowd soon gathered, and the diver was borne to a habitation, close adjoining Borobolus, whence, hearing of the disaster, we sallied out to render assistance. Upon entering the hut, the benevolent old king commanded it to be cleared, and then proceeded to examine the sufferer. The skull proved to be very badly fractured, in one place splintered. Let me mend it, said Samoa, with ardor. And being told of his experience in such matters, Borobola surrendered the patient. With a gourd of water and a tapa cloth, the one-armed Upoluan carefully washed the wound, and then calling for a sharp splinter of bamboo and a thin, semi-transparent cup of coconut shell, he went about the operation, nothing less than the tomoti, head-mending, in other words, the trepan. The patient still continuing insensible, the fragments were disengaged by help of a bamboo scalpel, when a piece of the drinking cup, previously dipped in the milk of a coconut, was nicely fitted into the vacancy, the skin as nicely adjusted over it, and the operation was complete. And now, while all present were crying out in admiration of Samoa's artistic skill, and Samoa himself stood complacently regarding his workmanship, Babalanja suggested that it might be well to ascertain whether the patient survived, when, upon sounding his heart, the diver was found to be dead. The bystanders loudly lamented, but declared the surgeon a man of marvellous science. Returning to Borobolas, much conversation ensued concerning the sad scene we had witnessed, which presently branched into a learned discussion upon matters of surgery at large. At length, Samoa regaled the company with a story, for the truth of which no one but him can vouch, for no one but him was by, at the time, though there is testimony to show that it involves nothing at variance with the customs of certain barbarous tribes. Read on. End of chapter 96 Chapter 97 of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume 1, by Herman Melville this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 97. Faith and Knowledge. A thing incredible is about to be related, but a thing may be incredible and still be true. Sometimes it is incredible because it is true, and many infidels but disbelieve the least incredible things, and many bigots reject the most obvious. 
but let us hold fast to all we have and stop all leaks in our faith lest an opening but of a hand's breadth should sink our seventy fours the wide atlantic can rush in at one porthole and if we surrender a plank we surrender the fleet panoplied in all the armour of st paul morion hauberk and greaves let us fight the turks inch by inch and yield them naught but our corpse but let us not turn round upon friends confounding them with foes for dissenters only assent to more than we though milton was a heretic to the creed of athanasius his faith exceeded that of athanasius himself and the faith of athanasius that of thomas the disciple who with his own eyes beheld the mark of the nails whence it comes that though we all be christians now the best of us had perhaps been otherwise in the days of thomas the higher the intelligence the more faith and the less credulity gabriel rejects more than we but out believes us all the greatest marvels are first truths and first truths the last under which we attain things nearest are furthest off though your ear be next door to your brain it is forever removed from your sight man has a more comprehensive view of the moon than the man in the moon himself we know the moon is round he only infers it it is because we ourselves are in ourselves that we know ourselves not and it is only of our easy faith that we were not infidels throughout and only of our lack of faith that we believe what we do in some universe old truths all mankind are disbelievers do you believe that you lived three thousand years ago that you were at the taking of tyre but overwhelmed in gomorrah no but for me i was at the subsiding of the deluge and helped swap the ground and build the first house with the israelites i fainted in the wilderness was in court when solomon outdid all the judges before him i it was who suppressed the lost work of manetho on the egyptian theology as containing mysteries not to be revealed to posterity and things at war with the canonical scriptures i who originated the conspiracy against that purple murderer domitian i who in the senate moved that great and good aurelian be emperor i instigated the abdication of diocletian and charles v i touched isabella's heart that she hearkened to columbus i am he that from the king's minions hid the charter in the old oak at hartford i harboured goff and wally i am the leader of the mohawk masks who in the old commonwealth's harbour overboard through the east india company souchong i am the veiled persian prophet i the man in the iron mask i junius End of chapter ninety seven chapter ninety eight of mahdi and a voyage thither volume one by herman melville this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ninety eight the tale of a traveller it was samoa who told the incredible tale and he told it as a traveller but stay at homes say travellers lie yet a voyage to ethiopia would cure them of that for few sceptics are travellers fewer travellers liars though the proverb respecting them lies it is false as some say that bruce was cousin german to baron munchausen but true as bruce said that the abyssinians cut live stakes from their cattle it was in good part his villainous transcribers who made monstrosities of mandeville's travels and yet though all liars go to gahana yet assuming that mandeville died before dante still though dante took the senses of hell we find not sir john under the likeness of a roasted neat's tongue in that infernalist of infernos the inferno but let not the truth be postponed to the stand samoa and through your interpreter speak once upon a time during his endless sea rovings the upoluan was called upon to cobble the head of a friend grievously hurt in a desperate fight of slings upon examination that part of the brain proving as much injured as the cranium itself a young pig was obtained and preliminaries being over part of its live brain was placed in the cavity the trepan accomplished with coconut shell and the scalp drawn over and secured this man died not but lived but from being a warrior of great sense and spirit he became a perverse-minded and piggish fellow showing many of the characteristics of his swinish grafting he survived the operation more than a year at the end of that period however going mad 
and dying in his delirium. Stoutly backed by the narrator, this anecdote was credited by some present, but Babalanja held out to the last. Yet if this story be true, said he, and since it is well settled that our brains are somehow the organs of sense, then I see not why human reason could not be put into a pig by letting into its cranium the contents of a man's. I have long thought that men, pigs, and plants are but curious physiological experiments, and that science would at last enable philosophers to produce new species of beings by somehow mixing and concocting the essential ingredients of various creatures, and so forming new combinations. My friend Atahalpa, the astrologer and alchemist, has long had a jar in which he has been endeavoring to hatch a fairy, the ingredients being compounded according to a receipt of his own. But little they heeded Babalanja. It was the traveler's tale that most arrested attention. Tough the thews, and tough the tales of Samoa. End of chapter 98「During the afternoon of the day of the diver's decease, preparations were making for paying the last rites to his remains, and carrying them by torchlight to the sepulchre, the sea for as in Odo so was the custom here. Meanwhile, all over the isle, to and fro went heralds, dismally arrayed, beating sharkskin drums, and, at intervals crying, A man is dead, let no fires be kindled, have mercy, O Oro, let no canoes put to sea, till the burial, this night, O Oro, let no food be cooked. And ever and anon, passed and repassed these, others in brave attire, with castanets of pearl-shells, making gay music, and these sang, Be merry, O men of Mondolo, a maiden this night is to wed. Be merry, O damsels of Mardi, flowers, flowers for the bridal bed. Informed that the preliminary rites were about being rendered, we repaired to the arbor, whither the body had been removed. Arrayed in white, it was laid out on a mat, its arms mutely crossed, between its lips, an asphodel, at the feet, a withered hawthorn bough. The relatives were wailing and cutting themselves with shells, so that blood flowed and spotted their vesture. Upon remonstrating with the most abandoned of these mourners, the wife of the diver, she exclaimed, Yes, great is the pain, but greater my affliction. Another, the deaf sire of the dead, went staggering about and groping, saying that he was now quite blind, for some months previous he had lost one eye, in the death of his eldest son, and now the other was gone. I am childless, he cried, henceforth, call me Roi Mori, that is, twice blind. While the relatives were thus violently lamenting, the rest of the company occasionally scratched themselves with their shells, but very slightly, and mostly, on the soles of their feet, from long exposure quite callous. This was interrupted, however, when the real mourners averted their eyes, though at no time was there any deviation in the length of their faces. But on all sides, lamentations afresh broke forth, upon the appearance of a person who had been called in to assist in solemnizing the obsequies, and also to console the afflicted. In rotundity he was another Borobola. He puffed and panted. As he approached the corpse, a sobbing silence ensued. When holding the hand of the dead between his, the stranger thus spoke, Mourn not, O friends of Carhono, that this your brother lives not. His wounded head pains him no more. He would not feel it, did a javelin pierce him. Yea, Carhono is exempt from all the ills and evils of this miserable Mardi. Hereupon the twice blind, who being deaf, heard not what was said, tore his gray hair, and cried, Alas, alas, my boy, thou art the merriest man in Mardi, and now thy pranks are over. But the other proceeded, Mourn not, I say, O friends of Carhono. The dead, whom ye deplore, is happier than the living. Is not his spirit in the aerial isles? True, true, responded the raving wife, mingling her blood with her tears. My own poor hapless Carhono is thrice happy in paradise. And anew she wailed and lacerated her cheeks. Rave not, I say. 
but she only raved the more. And now the good stranger departed, saying he must hie him to a wedding, waiting his presence in an arbor adjoining. Understanding that the removal of the body would not take place till midnight, we thought to behold the mode of marrying in Mondolo. Drawing near the place, we were greeted by merry voices and much singing, which greatly increased when the good stranger was perceived. Gaily arrayed in fine robes, with plumes on their heads, the bride and groom stood in the middle of a joyous throng, in readiness for the nuptial bond to be tied. Standing before them, the stranger was given a cord, so bedecked with flowers as to disguise its stout fibres, and taking the bride's hands, he bound them together to a ritual chant, about her neck in festoons, disposing the flowery ends of the cord. Then turning to the groom, he was given another, also beflowered, but attached thereto was a great stone, very much carved and stained, indeed so very disguised, that a person not knowing what it was, and lifting it, would be greatly amazed at its weight. This cord being attached to the waist of the groom, he leaned over toward the bride, by reason of the burden of the drop. All present now united in a chant, and danced about the happy pair, who meanwhile looked ill at ease, the one being so bound by the hands, the other solely weighted down by his stone. A pause ensuing the good stranger, turning them back to back, thus spoke, By thy flowery jives, O bride, I make thee a wife, and by thy burdensome stone, O groom, I make thee a husband. Live and be happy both, for the wise and good Oro hath placed us in Mardi to be glad. Doth not all nature rejoice in her green groves and her flowers, and woo and wed not the fowls of the air, thrilling their bliss in their bowers? Live then and be happy, O bride and groom, for Oro is offended with the unhappy, since he meant them to be gay. And the ceremony ended with a joyful feast. But not all nuptials in Mardi were like these. Others were wedded with different rites, without the stone and flowery jives. These were they who plighted their troth with tears, not smiles, and made responses in the heart. Returning from the house of the merry to the house of the mournful, we lingered till midnight to witness the issuing forth of the body. By torchlight, numerous canoes, with paddlers standing by, were drawn up on the beach to accommodate those who purposed following the poor diver to his home. The remains embarked, some confusion ensued concerning the occupancy of the rest of the shallops. At last, the procession glided off, our party included. Two by two, forming a long line of torches, trailing round the isle, the canoes all headed toward the opening in the reef. For a time, a decorous silence was preserved, but presently, some whispering was heard, perhaps melancholy discoursing, touching the close of the diver's career. But we were shocked to discover that poor Carjono was not much in their thoughts. They were conversing about the next breadfruit harvest, and the recent arrival of King Medea, and the party at Mondolo. From far in advance, however, were heard the lamentations of the true mourners, the relatives of the diver. Passing the reef and sailing a little distance therefrom, the canoes were disposed in a circle, the one bearing the corpse in the center. Certain ceremonies over, the body was committed to the waves, the white foam lighting up the last, long plunge of the diver, to see sights more strange than ever he saw in the brooding cells of the turtle reef. And now, while in the still midnight, all present were gazing down into the ocean, watching the white wake of the corpse, ever and anon illuminated by sparkles. An unknown voice was heard, and all started and vacantly stared, as this wild song was sung. We drop our dead in the sea, the bottomless, bottomless sea, each bubble a hollow sigh, as it sinks forever, and I. We drop our dead in the sea, the dead reek not of aught. We drop our dead in the sea, the sea ne'er gives it a thought. Sink, sink, O oh corpse, still sink, far down in the bottomless sea, where the unknown forms do prowl, down, down in the bottomless sea. Tis night above, and night all round, and night will it be with thee, as thou sinkest and sinkest for I, deeper down in the bottomless sea. The mysterious voice died away, no sign of the corpse was now seen, and mute with amaze, the company long listed to the low moan of the billows and the sad sough of the breeze. At last, without speaking, 
the obsequies were concluded by sliding into the ocean a carved tablet of palmetto to mark the place of the burial but a wave crest received it and fast it floated away returning to the isle long silence prevailed but at length as if the scene in which they had just taken part afresh reminded them of the mournful event which had called them together the company again recurred to it some present sadly and incidentally alluding to borabola's banquet of turtle thereby postponed end of chapter ninety nine Chapter One Hundred of Maudie and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter One Hundred: The Pursuer Himself Is Pursued. Next morning, when, much to the chagrin of Borabola, we were preparing to quit his isle, came tidings to the palace of a wonderful event occurring in one of the Motus or little islands of the Great Reef, which Motu was included in the dominions of the king. The men who brought these tidings were highly excited, and no sooner did they make known what they knew than all Mondolo was in a tumult of marvelling. Their story was this. Going at daybreak to the Motu to fish, they perceived a strange proa beached on its seaward shore, and presently were hailed by voices, and saw among the palm trees three spectre-like men who were not of Mardi. The first amazement of the fishermen over, in reply to their eager questions, the strangers related that they were the survivors of a company of men, natives of some unknown island, to the northeast, whence they had embarked for another country, distant three days sailed, to the southward of theirs. But falling in with a terrible adventure, in which their sire had been slain, they altered their course to pursue the fugitive who murdered him, one and all vowing never more to see home until their father's fate was avenged. The murderer's proa out sailing theirs soon ran out of sight, yet after him they blindly steered by day and by night, steering by the blood-red star in boots. Soon a violent gale overtook them, driving them to and fro, leaving them they knew not where, but still struggling against strange currents, at times counteracting their sailing. They drifted on their way, nigh to famishing for water, and no shore in sight. In long calms, in vain, they held up their dry gourds to heaven and cried, Send us a breeze, sweet gods. The calm still brooded, and ere it was gone, all but three gasped, and dead from thirst, were plunged into the sea. The breeze which followed the calm soon brought them in sight of a low, uninhabited isle, where, tarrying many days, they laid in good store of coconuts and water, and again embarked. The next land they saw was Mardi, and they landed on the Motu, still intent on revenge. This recital filled Taji with horror. Who could these avengers be but the sons of him I had slain? I had thought them far hence, and myself forgotten, and now, like adders, they started up in my path, as I hunted for Yilla. But I dissembled my thoughts. Without waiting to hear more, Borabola, all curiosity to behold the strangers, instantly dispatched to the Motu, one of the fleetest canoes, with orders to return with the voyagers. Ere long they came in sight, and perceiving that strange proa in tow of the king's, Samoa cried out, Lo, Taji, the canoe that was going to Tadaiti. Too true, the same double-heeled craft, now sorely broken, the fatal dais in wild disarray, the canoe, the canoe of Alima, and with it came the spearmen three who, when the chamois was fleeing from their bow, had poised their javelins, but so wan their aspect now, their faces looked like skulls. Then came over me the wild dream of Yella, and for a space, like a madman, I raved. It seemed as if the mysterious damsel must still be there, the rescue yet to be achieved. In my delirium I rushed upon the skeletons, as they landed, hide not the maiden, but interposing, Medea led me aside, when my transports abated. Now instantly the strangers knew who I was, and brandishing their javelins, they rushed upon me, as I had upon them, with a yell. But deeming us all mad, the crowd held us apart, when writhing in the arms that restrained them, the pale spectres foamed out their curses again and again. O oh, murderer, white curses upon thee, bleached be thy soul with our hate, living our brethren cursed thee 
and dying dry-lipped they cursed thee again they died not through famishing for water but for revenge upon thee thy blood their thirst would have slaked i lay fainting against the hard throbbing heart of samoa while they showered their yells through the air once more in my thoughts the green corpse of the priest drifted by among the people of mondolo a violent commotion now raged they were amazed at taji's recognition by the strangers and at the deadly ferocity they betrayed rallying upon this and perceiving that by divulging all they knew these sons of alima might stir up the islanders against me i resolved to anticipate their story and turning to borabola said in these strangers o king you behold the survivors of a band we encountered on our voyage from them i rescued a maiden called yillah whom they were carrying captive little more of their history do i know their maledictions exclaimed borabola are they not delirious with suffering i cried they know not what they say so moved by all this he commanded them to be guarded and conducted within his palisade and having supplied them with cheer entered into earnest discourse yet all the while the pale strangers on me fixed their eyes deep dry crater-like hollows lurid with flames reflected from the fear-frozen glacier my soul but though their hatred appalled spite of that spell again the sweet dream of yillah stole over me with all the mysterious things by her narrated but left unexplained and now before me were those who might reveal the lost maiden's whole history previous to the fatal affray thus impelled i besought them to disclose what they knew but where now is your yillah they cried is the murderer wedded and merry bring forth the maiden yet though they tore out my heart's core i told them not of my loss then anxious to learn the history of yillah all present commanded them to divulge it and breathlessly i heard what follows of yillah we know only this that many moons ago a mighty canoe full of beings white like this murderer taji touched at our island of ama received with wonder they were worshipped as gods were feasted all over the land their chief was a tower to behold and with him was a being whose cheeks were of the colour of the red coral her eye tender as the blue of the sky every day our people brought her offerings of fruit and flowers which last she could not retain for herself but hung them round the neck of her child yillah then only an infant in her mother's arms a bud nestling close to a flower full-blown all went well between our people and the gods till at last they slew three of our countrymen charged with stealing from their great canoe our warriors retired to the hills brooding over revenge three days went by when by night descending to the plain in silence they embarked gained the great vessel and slaughtered every soul but yillah the bud was torn from the flower and by our father alima was carried to the valley of ardair there set apart as a sacred offering for apo our deity many moons passed and there arose a tumult hostile to our sires longer holding custody of yillah when foreseeing that the holy glen would ere long be burst open he embarked the maiden in yonder canoe to accelerate her sacrifice at the great shrine of apo in Tadaidi. the rest thou knowest murderer yillah yillah now hunted again that sound through my soul o oh, yillah too late too late have i learned what thou art apprised of the disappearance of their former captive the meagre strangers exulted declaring that apo had taken her to himself for me ere long my blood they would quaff from my skull but though i shrunk from their horrible threats i dissembled anew and turning again swore that they raved i they retorted we rave and raven for you and your white heart will we have perceiving the violence of their rage and persuaded from what i said that much suffering at sea must have maddened them borabola thought it fit to confine them for the present so that they could not molest me End of chapter one hundred Chapter One Hundred and One of Mardi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter One Hundred and One, The Iris. That evening in the groves came to me three gliding forms, Hautia's heralds. The iris mixed with nettles said Yumi, a cruel message. With the right hand, 
the second siren presented glossy green wax myrtle berries, those that burn like tapers, the third a lily of the valley, crushed in its own broad leaf. This done, they earnestly eyed Yumi, who, after much pondering, said, I speak for Hautia, who by these berries says, I will enlighten you. Oh, give me then that light, say, where is Yilla? And I rushed upon the heralds, but eluding me, they looked reproachfully at Yumi, seemed offended. Then I am wrong, said Yumi. It is thus, Taji, you have been enlightened, but the lily you seek is crushed. Then fell my heart, and the phantoms nodded, flinging upon me bilberries like rose petals, which bruised against my skin, left stains. Waving oleanders, they retreated. Harm, treachery, beware, cried Yumi. Then they glided through the wood, one showering dead leaves, along the path I trod, the others gaily waving bunches of spring crocuses, yellow, white, and purple. And thus they vanished. Said Yumi, sad your path, but merry how tears. Then merry may she be, whoe'er she is, and though woe be mine, I turn not from that to how tia, nor ever will I woo her, though she woo me until I die, though Yilla never bless my eyes. End of chapter 101「One Hundred and Two of Maudi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One, by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter One Hundred and Two. They depart from Mondolo. Night passed, and the next morning we made preparations for leaving Mondolo that day. But fearing anew, lest after our departure the men of Ama might stir up against me, the people of the Isle. I determined to yield to the earnest solicitations of Borobola and leave Jarl behind for a remembrance of Taji, if necessary, to vindicate his name. Apprised hereof, my follower was loath to acquiesce. His guiltless spirit feared not the strangers, lest selfish considerations prevailed. He was willing to remain on the island for a time, but not without me. Yet setting forth my reasons, and assuring him that our tour would not be long in completing, when we would not fail to return, previous to sailing for Odo, he at last, but reluctantly, assented. At Mondolo we also parted with Samoa, whether it was that he feared our avengers, whom he may have thought would follow on my track, or whether the islands of Mardi answered not in attractiveness to the picture his fancy had painted, or whether the restraint put upon him by the domineering presence of King Medea was too irksome withal, or whether, indeed, he relished not those disquisitions with which Babalanja regaled us. However it may have been, certain it was that Samoa was impatient of the voyage. He besought permission to return to Odo, there to await my return, and a canoe of Mondolo being about to proceed in that direction, permission was granted, and departing for the other side of the island, from thence he embarked. Long after dark tidings came, that at early dawn he had been found dead, in the canoe, three arrows in his side. Yumi was at a loss to account for the departure of Samoa, who, while ashore, had expressed much desire to roam. Medea, however, declared that he must be returning to some inamorata, but Babalanja averred that the Upoluan was not the first man who had turned back after beginning a voyage like our own. To this, after musing, Yumi assented. Indeed, I had noticed that already the warbler had abated those sanguine assurances of success with which he had departed from Odo. The futility of our search thus far seemed ominous to him of the end. On the eve of embarking, we were accompanied to the beach by Borobola, who, with his own hand, suspended from the shark's mouth of Medea's canoe, three red ripe bunches of plantains, a farewell gift to his guests. Though he spoke not a word, Jarl was long in taking leave. His eyes seemed to say, I will see you no more. At length we pushed from the strand, Borobola waving his adieus with a green leaf of banana, our comrade ruefully eyeing the receding canoes, and the multitude loudly invoking for us a prosperous voyage. But to my horror, there suddenly dashed through the crowd the three spectre sons of Alima, escaped from their prison. With clenched hands they stood in the water, and cursed me anew. And with that curse in our sails, we swept off. End of chapter 102 
Chapter One Hundred and Three of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither, Volume One by Herman Melville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter One Hundred and Three. As they sail, as the canoes now glided across the lagoon, I gave myself up to reverie and revolving over all that the men of Amma had rehearsed of the history of Yilla, I one by one unriddled the mysteries before so baffling. Now all was made plain, no secret remaining, but the subsequent event of her disappearance. Yes, how Tia, enlightened, I had been, but where was Yilla? Then I recalled that last interview with how Tia's messengers, so full of enigmas, and wondered whether Yumi had interpreted aright, unseen and unsolicited, still pursuing me with omens, with taunts, and with wooings. Mysterious how Tia appalled me. Vaguely, I began to fear her, and the thought that perhaps again and again her heralds would haunt me filled me with a nameless dread, which I almost shrank from acknowledging. Inwardly, I prayed that never more they might appear. While full of these thoughts, Medea interrupted them by saying that the minstrel was about to begin one of his chants, a thing of his own composing, and therefore, as he himself said, all critics must be lenient, for Yumi at times, not always, was a timid youth, distrustful of his own sweet genius, for poesy. The words were about a curious hereafter, believed in by some people in Mahdi, a sort of nocturnal paradise, where the sun and its heat are excluded, one long lunar day, with twinkling stars to keep company. The song. Far off in the sea is Marlena, a land of shades and dreams, a land of many delights. Dark and bold thy shores, Marlena, but green and timorous thy soft knolls, crouching behind the woodlands. All shady thy hills, all gleaming thy springs, like eyes in the earth looking at you. How charming thy haunts, Marlena! Oh, the waters that flow through Onimo! Oh, the leaves that rustle through Pono! Oh, the roses that blossom in Tarma! Come and see the valley of Vina! How sweet, how sweet! The isles from Hind, tis I afternoon of the full full moon, and ever the season of fruit, and ever the hour of flowers, and never the time of rains and gales, all in and about Marlena. Soft sigh the boughs in the stilly air, soft lap the beach, the billows there, and in the woods or by the streams you needs must nod in the land of dreams. Yumi, said old Mohi with a yawn, you composed that song then, did you? I did, said Yumi, placing his turban a little to one side. Then, minstrel, you shall sing me to sleep every night, especially with that song of Marlena. It is soporific as the airs of Norabama. Mean you, old man, that my lines, setting forth the luxurious repose to be enjoyed hereafter, are composed with such skill that the description begets the reality? Or would you ironically suggest that the song is a sleepy thing itself? An important discrimination, said Medea, which mean you, Mohi? Now you are a silly boy, said Babalanja, when from the ambiguity of his speech you could so easily have derived something flattering, thus to seek to extract unpleasantness from it. Be wise, Yumi, and hereafter, whenever a remark like that seems equivocal, be sure to wrest commendation from it, though you torture it to the quick. And most sure am I that I would ever do so, but often, I so incline to a distrust of my powers, that I am far more keenly alive to censure than to praise, and always deem it the more sincere of the two, and no praise so much elates me as censure depresses. End of chapter 103
a harem scarum young chief replied medea heir to three islands he likes nothing better than the sport you now see him at he must be possessed by a devil said mohi said babalanja then he is only like all of us what say you cried medea i say as old bardiana in the nineteen hundred and ninety-ninth book of his immortal pondering saith that all men as i live my lord he has swamped three canoes cried mohi pointing off the beam but just then a fiery fin-backed whale having broken into the paddock of the lagoon threw up a high fountain of foam almost under tribonora's nose who quickly turning about his canoe cur-like slunk off his steering paddle between his legs comments over babalanja you were going to quote said medea proceed thank you my lord says old bardiana all men are possessed by devils but as these devils are sent into men and kept in them for an additional punishment not garrisoning a fortress but limboed in a bridewell so it may be more just to say that the devils themselves are possessed by men not men possessed by them faith cried medea though sometimes a bore your old bardiana is a trump i have long been of that mind my lord but let me go on says bardiana devils are diverse strong devils and weak devils knowing devils and silly devils mad devils and mild devils devils merely devils devils themselves bedeviled devils doubly bedeviled and in the devil's name what sort of a devil is yours cried mohi of him anon interrupt me not old man thus then my lord as devils are diverse diverse are the devils in men whence the wide difference we see but after all the main difference is this that one man's devil is only more of a devil than another's and be bedeviled as much as you will yet may you perform the most bedeviled of actions with impunity so long as you only bedevil yourself for it is only when your deviltry injures another that the other devils conspire to confine yours for a mad one that is to say if you are easily handled for there are many bedeviled bedlamites in mardi doing an infinity of mischief who are too brawny in the arms to be tied a very devilish doctrine that cried mohi i don't believe it my lord said babalanja here's collateral proof the sage lawgiver yamjama who flourished long before bardiana roundly asserts that all men who knowingly do evil are bedeviled for good is happiness happiness the object of living and evil is not good if the sage yamjama said that said old mohi the sage yamjama might have bettered the saying it is not quite so plain as it might be yamjama disdained to be plain he scorned to be fully comprehended by mortals like all oracles he dealt in dark sayings but old bardiana was of another sort he spoke right out going straight to the point like a javelin especially when he laid it down for a universal maxim that minus exceptions all men are bedeviled of course then said medea you include yourself among the number most assuredly and so did old bardiana who somewhere says that being thoroughly bedeviled himself he was so much the better qualified to discourse upon the deviltries of his neighbors but in another place he seems to contradict himself by asserting that he is not so sensible of his own deviltry as of other people's hold cried medea who have we here and he pointed ahead of our prow to three men in the water urging themselves along each with a paddle we made haste to overtake them who are you said medea where from and where bound from variora they answered and bound to mondolo and did that devil tribonora swamp your canoe asked medea offering to help them into ours we had no such useless encumbrance to lose they replied resting on their backs and panting with their exertions if we had had a canoe we would have had to paddle it along with us whereas we have only our bodies to paddle you are a parcel of loons exclaimed medea but go your ways if you are satisfied with your locomotion well and good now it is an extreme case i grant said babalanja but those poor devils there help to establish old bardiana's position they belong to that species of our bedeviled race called simpletons but their devils harming none but themselves are permitted to be at large with the fish whereas tribonora's devil who daily runs down canoes drowning their occupants belongs to the species of out-and-out -out devils but being high in station and strongly backed by kith and kin tribonora cannot be mastered and put in a straitjacket 
For myself, I think my devil is somewhere between these two extremes. At any rate, he belongs to that class of devils who harm not other devils. I am not so sure of that, retorted Medea. Methinks this doctrine of yours about all mankind being bedeviled will work a deal of mischief, seeing that by implication it absolves you mortals from moral accountability. Furthermore, as your doctrine is exceedingly evil, by Yam Jamma's theory it follows that you must be proportionably bedeviled, and since it harms others, your devil is of the number of those whom it is best to limbo, and since he is one of those that can be limboed, limboed he shall be in you. And so saying, he humorously commanded his attendants to lay hands upon the bedeviled philosopher and place a bandage upon his mouth, that he might no more disseminate his devilish doctrine. Against this, Babalanja demurred, protesting that he was no orangutan to be so rudely handled. Better and better, said Medea. You but illustrate Bardiana's theory that men are not sensible of their being bedeviled. Thus tantalized, Babalanja displayed few signs of philosophy. Whereupon said Medea, Assuredly his devil is foaming, behold his mouth, and he commanded him to be bound hand and foot. At length, seeing all resistance ineffectual, Babalanja submitted, but not without many objurgations. Presently, however, they released him. When Medea inquired how he relished the application of his theory, and whether he was still of old Bardiana's mind, to which, haughtily adjusting his robe, Babalanja decried, The strong arm, my lord, is no argument, though it overcomes all logic. End of chapter 104 And End of Mahdi and a Voyage Thither by Herman Melville